witness mic check. Good.
The uh, Subcommittee on Environment and Climate Change will now come to order. I recognize myself for five minutes for the purposes of an opening statement. The events of, sep of September 11th transformed how we think about what it means to be safe in our communities. America responded with a national mobilization to confront the threat of future attacks, including the establishment of programs like the one we will consider here today. We learned a hard lesson that we must always be vigilant and acknowledge that our federal government, including this committee, plays a critical role in safeguarding the health and safety of the people working in, living near, and responding to incidents at our nation's high-risk chemical facilities. Thank you to our colleagues on the Homeland Security Committee for starting this process, Mr. Richmond and Chairman Thompson's bill, H.R. 3256, the Protecting and Securing Chemical Facilities from Terrorist Attacks Act of 2019, is the basis for today's legislative hearing. Since 2007, chemical facilities have been regulated to address risks under the Chemical Facility Anti-Terrorism Standards, or CFATS, a program that's been implemented by the Department of Homeland Security. CFATS is an important part of our nation's counterterrorism efforts to secure high-risk chemical facilities. Under CFATS, around 3,300 manufacturing, handling, and storage facility facilities must implement risk-based performance standards in some 18 areas. The program received its first multi-year extension in 2014, and in January of this year, Congress acted to extend the program through April of 2020 and prevent a potentially dangerous lapse. It is my hope that this committee will once again find bipartisan agreement on a multi-year CFATS extension that can be supported by the leadership on both House committees of jurisdiction from both sides of the aisle. Everyone here understands the importance of a multi-year extension, which would give the program a vital measure of certainty and stability. But as Congress considers a CFAS reauthorization, we cannot afford to overlook this opportunity to reinforce what is working well and address what could be improved. Today, I expect to hear that this program generally enjoys support from chemical manufacturers, distributors, and workers at these sites. There remain numerous ways in which it could be strengthened. I'm open to hearing suggestions, especially those that help ensure workers and local communities are being in, uh, consulted and participating appropriately in the program and receiving the information they need to stay safe. I also want to hear from our witnesses how the program can greater incentivize risk reduction, not just risk management. Risk reduction is ultimately the best way to ensure the protection of workers and frontline communities. With that said, I'm skeptical of any change that would create new security gaps by allowing for additional exemptions to the program. We need, instead, to be looking more holistically at the threats facing these facilities. Without question, they are evolving, and not just from terrorism and malicious acts. When it comes to protecting workers, first responders, and surrounding communities, safety and resilience are as important as security. Chemical fires, explosions, and releases can have serious consequences regardless of whether an incident was an accident, a natural disaster, or an act of terrorism. We saw in the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey in Texas that extreme weather can be just as big a threat as more traditional security concerns. The people working at these facilities and living in nearby communities should be able to expect the same measure of protection and risk mitigation. And I hope the appropriate agencies will work to ensure the development of industry guidance to help facilities assess their risks from extreme weather. September 11, 2001, forever changed how our nation thinks about security. We have achieved much in the 18 years since, but we cannot rest on our heels or become stagnant in our thinking. Threats to chemical facilities continue to evolve, from cybersecurity to extreme weather events, and the programs that guarantee the safety of workers, first responders, and frontline communities must also evolve to meet these threats. Thank you to Mr. Wolf for appearing before the subcommittee once again, and I also welcome our witnesses on the second panel. That I look forward to today's discussion, and I yield back. Chair now recognizes the uh, ranker of the uh, subcommittee, uh, Representative Shimkus of Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the time today. The subcommittee will not only check in on the progress of the Chemical Facilities Anti-Terrorism Standards Program, commonly known as CFATS, at the Department of Homeland Security, but also review legislation introduced to both save the program's authority from expiring as well as make significant changes to the program. 
The CFETS program, which Congress first authorized in the fall of 2006, was a continuation of congressional efforts since the terror attacks that occurred 18 years ago today. This law, then re referred to as Section 550, surgically and directly addressed gaps in federal law regarding terrorism and other intentional acts against high-risk facilities due to their use or possession of chemicals of concern at levels of concern. The core of this new security-focused law was a process where DHS issued risk-based performance standards that required vulnerability assessments and site security plans by covered facilities. Most importantly, to avoid overlapping with other federal programs, CFATS was designed to foster collaboration between government and regulated parties. Unfortunately, the early years of CFATS program implementation were marked with several growing pains, some more hurtful than others. No one knows that more than our witness from the Department of Homeland Security, David Wolf. I said last June that his commitment and longevity with the program make him the Cal Ripken of CFATS, and I think others would agree with me. Last June, we learned that Mr. Wolf not only set many remedial goals to address issues he and the Government Accountability Office found in the CFATS program. Under his watch, tremendous progress has been made towards correcting those programs, reinvigorating morale, improving communication, reviving the confidence in the CFATS program. My congratulations to you. I think today CFATS has earned an extension of his program authority. That's great, but Congress needs to ensure that CFATS program is a success because it is a success success, and not just because of the leadership of one or two people. After, uh, after Cal Ripken retired, his team took 10 years to recover from, to a competitive position. Given that stopping terrorism is CFAT's job, we should not assume stability after so much change to correct this program's problems. That is why I don't believe that CFAT needs to expand its mission. I'm concerned by provisions in HR 3256 that either provide DHS authority to offer CFATs to unregulated facilities or require study of those facilities exempted from CFATs facilities, exempted because Congress gave them their own anti-terrorism programs for their unique circumstances. I'm also concerned about the precedent for layering specific requirements onto site security plan approval. No matter how well-meaning when meeting the risk-based performance standards already accomplishes those requirements. A third thing that bothers me in this legislation is the redefinition of risk for the CFATS program and the directive to deploy that new definition. The existing definition of risk for CFATS, vulnerability, threat, consequence, is based on GAO recommendations and the National Infrastructure Protection Program. One of the biggest problems DHS had to uh, rectify is that the CFATS program used an incomplete definition of risk that discounted vulnerability and placed more facilities into the program and at a higher risk categories. DHS spent years undoing this mess, but the legislation acts as if the mistakes were correcting the risk formula to make it more consistent. More significantly, I am concerned that this legislation rolls back essential protection and vulnerability information that would create a roadmap for terrorists. There are multiple federal laws that require disclosure of information to the public and first responders for any number of reasons. The difference between this bill and those laws is that CFAT's information is not focused on pollution or accidents, but how a high-risk chemical is being protected from theft or intentional detonation. First responders and local officials already have this access to this information if they have a need to know and are trained in handling it. Making this information public will cause material, physical, and economic harm to these facilities and their communities. My misgiving is aside, I look forward to receiving language from you, Mr. Chairman, and meaningfully working with my colleagues to a good place where we can support this bill when it gets marked up. I want to thank our witnesses for being with us today, and I look forward to a meaningful dialogue with them. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. The uh, gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes uh, Representative Pallone, chairman of the full committee, for five minutes for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Tonka. Today, on the 18th anniversary of the September 11th terrorist attacks, we are here to discuss important security legislation that could help prevent another attack. We'll never forget 9-11 and its longstanding impacts on families, first responders, and our nation as a whole. The lessons we learned in the days and years after 9-11 should inform our efforts to strengthen the Chemical Facility Anti-Terrorism Standards Program, otherwise known as CFATS. And this program provides critical national security protections by requiring chemical facilities 
that are high-risk terrorist targets to assess and address their vulnerabilities. High-risk chemical facilities hold large stores of industrial chemicals that pose a safety and security risk to the American people if they're released or detonated. A recent report found that more than 134 million Americans live in the vulnerability zones around chemical facilities. That's more than one-third of Americans. And the communities most at risk are disproportionately low-income communities and communities of color. And unfortunately, the threats to these facilities are only increasing as climate change makes extreme weather more and more common, and CFAT's regulated facilities have been impacted by hurricanes, floods, and wildfires, putting us all at risk. So I've been an advocate for increased safety and security at our nation's chemical facilities for many years, well before the CFATS program was established in 2006. My home state of New Jersey, which has a high population density, also has a large number of chemical facilities, so the consequences of lack of security could be devastating there. And that's why New Jersey led the way on chemical plant security, adopting requirements for the assessment of so-called inherently safer technology, and adopting mandatory security standards before the federal program was in place. Earlier this year, the CFATS program came close to lapsing. Despite the importance of the program and support on both sides of the aisle, the authorization came within 10 days of expiring during the Trump government shutdown. A bill in the Senate also sought to seriously weaken the program with changes, including an ill-advised exemption for explosives. Fortunately, Ranking Member Walden and I were able to work with our colleagues on the Homeland Security Committee to extend the program through April 20th, I, I'm sorry, through April of 2020 without these misguided changes. So now we have the opportunity to strengthen and improve the program, and I look forward to continuing to work in a bipartisan fashion to move the legislation forward again. It's critical that we get this done. Uh, three major chemical incidents this year, one in Crosby, Texas, another in LaPorte, Texas, and a third in South Philadelphia, underscore the need to do more. H.R. 3256, the Protecting and Securing Chemical Facilities from Terrorist Attacks Act of 2019, would extend the authorization for this important program and make some welcome improvements. The bill would strengthen the role of workers at covered facilities and improve reporting to Congress. It would require the Department of Homeland Security to verify information submitted by a covered facility before using it to lower that facility's risk tier. And it would eliminate the worrisome expedited approval program. So I look forward to hearing from the stakeholders today about these and other improvements that can be made to the program. And I hope we can continue to work together to ensure the security of these facilities and protect the surrounding communities. I don't think anyone wants the time, um, so I will yield back, Mr. Chairman. A gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes Representative Walden, who's ranking member of the full committee, for five minutes for his opening statement. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this really important hearing and your dedication to this issue. And I want to thank my colleague, the chairman of the full committee, uh, for the work we did last uh, Congress and uh, the work that uh, we're going to do in a bipartisan way this Congress. Yeah, so thank you right. for that. I, on, on this day of 9-11, uh, uh, we should also remember our freedom is never free and never can be taken for granted. And, uh, and that's kind of uh, that event led us to this bill. I remember being at a table much like this when it was older and scratched up because they've remodeled the building. But after 9-11, when we had one of those discussions and Remember we were talking about community right to know and how everything was posted on websites about where all the worst things were so your first responders would know, and then we realized that was a roadmap for the terrorists. And, and everything changed on that day and the way we approached these issues um, and how to protect and secure, and I, I'll never forget some of those um, discussions about how, how things had changed. So we know CFATS was, was then created after that terrorist attack on 9-11. And at that time, Congress examined federal authority to address theft and diversion um, and terrorism at chemical facilities and found the existing accident prevention and process safety laws were insufficient and inappropriate uh, to tackle these concerns. Congress decided a separate and distinct body of law and requirements were needed to secure these facilities and that leaving the Clean Air Act to address general safety and accident concerns that might affect air quality, Congress used CFATS to fill the legal gaps for addressing um, those intentional acts that compromise the security of this critical infrastructure sector. So CFATS was not intended to be your garden variety regulatory program. CFATS not only covers huge chemical and petrochemical complexes, but also uh, racetracks. And uh, importantly in our region, uh, with, with my friend from Washington, wineries and breweries. 
um, universities and colleges and hospitals and other health care providers. Due to the scope of the program and the fact that each facility faces different security challenges and to avoid overlapping with other federal programs, CFATS was designed to foster collaboration between the government and the regulated parties, and this collaboration and compliance leads to facilities that are actually more secure. So it's partnership. I mentioned at the start of our hearing last fall that CFATS program had to overcome some tough years. Our subcommittee received testimony that day from the Government Accountability Office and other stakeholders that the department spent four years correcting the program, including updating its application of the department risk criteria to decisions under um, CFATS. CFATS must provide value to taxpayers, the federal government, and the facilities that could fall victim to intentional attacks. And to do that, I believe the program improvements must be sustainable and they must be reliable. For this reason, I'm skeptical of making major changes to the program that would either dilute or divert the department from its statutory mission or replicate authorities that other federal agencies have been given by Congress. So, Mr. Chairman, I know we're here to discuss legislation that keeps CFAT's authority from expiring this coming April, and we should not have this anti-terrorism program expire, period. I understand the Homeland Security Committee marked up this bill 12 weeks ago and it passed on a straight party line vote with no Republicans supporting it, but I also understand they have not formally reported their bill. Our committee has been overseeing this program since its inception and today continues Energy and Commerce's committee's work. So I, I look forward to working with you, Mr. Chairman, and the full committee chairman to see where we can strike a, a bipartisan agreement that works for the country. So I want to welcome our witness uh, for being here today. And thank you all for sharing your views. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll yield back the balance of my time. And as a disclaimer, we have a second subcommittee hearing going on simultaneously, so I must depart for that one. But uh, thank you for holding this hearing. We look forward to working with you in good faith. Well, thank you very much. The uh, gentleman yields back. The chair would like to remind members that pursuant to committee rules, all members' written opening statements shall be made part of the record. Um, I now introduce our sole witness for our first panel. Mr. David Wolf, Acting De uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Infrastructure Protection at the Department of Homeland Security. Thank you, uh, Secretary Wolf, for joining us. We appreciate uh, your time and your, um, your uh, ideas and thoughts on uh, the legislation. Before we begin, I would like to explain the lighting system. In front of you are a series of lights. The light will initially be green at the start of your opening statement. The light will turn yellow when you have one minute remaining. Please begin to wrap up your testimony at that point. The light will turn red when your time expires. So at this time, the chair will recognize uh, Mr. Wolf for five minutes to provide his opening statement. Uh, Secretary Wolf. So, uh, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Shimkus, and uh, other members of the uh, committee. Really uh, do appreciate the opportunity to be here today to provide an update on the progress the Chemical Facility Anti-Terrorism Standards program, or CFATS, continues to make in fostering security at America's highest risk chemical facilities. So recognizing that we're here today on September 11th and recalling the devastating terrorist attacks carried out on the state 18 years ago, uh, it's important to note that as a nation, we have made much progress in securing America's critical infrastructure. Uh, of course, uh, we can never let our guard down, however, which is precisely why we come to work every day at the Department of Homeland Security and in our new cybersecurity and infrastructure security agency focused on securing today and defending tomorrow. And with respect specifically to the CFATS program, a program that remains squarely focused on securing high-risk facilities and preventing acts of chemical terrorism, the same holds true. So it is no secret that the CFATS program faced some significant challenges in its early years. In 2012 and 2013, as we were laying the foundation for key improvements, I did come before this committee and I emphasized the importance of long-term authorization for this critical national security program. And I'm very grateful for the leadership the committee demonstrated in securing the four-year CFATS authorization that was signed into law in December of 2014. And I'm grateful as well for your role in attaining the 15-month extension of that authorization through April of 2020 that was enacted earlier this year. So I'm appreciative that the committee is again working to ensure continuing long-term authorization of CFATS. So the stability that was ushered in with long-term authorization has uh, absolutely driven unprecedented progress as our team has worked with CFATS covered facilities to make America's high-risk chemical infrastructure a truly hard target, with literally tens of thousands of security measures having been put into place at high-risk chemical facilities across the nation. These facilities have achieved on average a 55% increase in their security posture as a direct result of CFATS. 
The stability afforded by long-term authorization has facilitated our planning and execution of important programmatic improvements, a few of which I'll detail in a moment, while it has also afforded regulated industry stakeholders with the certainty they deserved as they planned for and made capital investments in CFATS-related security measures. Later today, you'll have the opportunity to hear directly from industry and other stakeholders about their experience with CFATS. The gains I've just noted would not have been possible without the commitment and hard work of companies across the nation that have put CFATS-focused security measures and in many cases have put those measures in place and in many cases have provided important feedback and ideas that have helped us to improve our processes and our effectiveness. So many of those stakeholders are here in the room today. I appreciate their presence and I'm looking forward to the perspectives that will be shared by the next panel. And of course, I do want to acknowledge our very hardworking CFATS team, 250 folks here in Washington and across the nation who have built a truly world-class program and who are laser-focused on securing America's high-risk chemical infrastructure. So about those programmatic improvements I mentioned, what have we been doing to make CFATS even stronger as we've enjoyed the stability of long-term authorization? We've improved processes, eliminated bottlenecks, and seen unprecedented progress in the pace of inspections and in the review of uh, facility site security plans, eliminating a backlog of security plan reviews six years ahead of earlier GAO projections. We've developed and launched an improved risk assessment methodology. We've implemented the CFATS Personnel Surety Program, affording CFATS covered facilities the ability to ensure that individuals with access to critical assets have been vetted for terrorist ties, and we've dramatically reduced burden across our stakeholder community. Now, while the stability afforded by long-term authorization has yielded all of this progress over the past four, past four or five years, we are not done yet and uh, continued long-term authorization will be absolutely critical to ensuring that we're able to focus on driving even more effective and even more efficient approaches to fostering chemical security. Now, as we look toward the future, I do think it's important to note that CFAT's regulatory coverage is targeted to the nation's highest risk chemical facilities, a universe that currently is composed of approximately 3,300 facilities. Now, while CFATS has contributed to effectively hardening these high-risk facilities against the prospect of terrorist attack, we've actually received top screen reports, the reports that are filed by companies to initiate the DHS risk assessment process from more than 30,000 additional facilities. Now, while we've determined that these additional facilities do not present a high risk of terrorism, they nonetheless maintain inventories of CFATS chemicals of interest, the very sorts of chemicals that are viewed as attractive by our adversaries and that are used in attacks around the globe. So while these facilities are not considered high risk under CFATS, they are no risk facilities. And it's for this reason that we'd very much like to work with this committee and the Congress on a path toward authorizing our chemical security inspectors to work with these facilities completely at the option of the individual facility on a voluntary, non-regulatory basis. And this is a, a point that it's important to emphasize. We'd like our inspectors to be able to share their expertise with these facilities, to provide assistance, and to offer consultation on security measures, not to extend CFATS regulation to these facilities. In our view, this is an important next step to build upon the culture of chemical security that CFATS has fostered. Now, as we are all too aware, the threat of chemical terrorism remains a real and a very relevant one. Around the globe, our adversaries continue to seek, acquire, and use and attacks chemicals of the sort that trigger coverage under CFATS, and the threat stream continues to reflect that chemical facilities themselves remain an attractive target for terrorists. I can tell you with certainty that the work we are doing as an extended chemical security community is making a real difference in protecting our nation. And having had the opportunity to work with my counterparts in other nations, I can tell you that what we're doing here in the United States through CFATS, the culture of chemical security you have helped us to build with your support for long-term CFATS authorization is absolutely the envy of the world. With its targeted focus on the highest risk facilities, with its 18 comprehensive risk-based performance standards addressing physical, cyber, and insider threats, and with its non-prescriptive, flexible approach to regulation, CFATS is well-suited to enhancing security across the very diverse landscape of high-risk chemical facilities. So I would like to again thank this committee and your top-notch staff uh, for your leadership on CFATS uh, authorization, for your patience with my extended uh, statement as well. Uh, we are fond of saying that chemical security is a shared commitment, uh, and not unlike the role of our industry and other stakeholders and the role of our very talented DHS team, the role of Congress in shaping and authorizing CFATS for the long term has been hugely important and looking forward very much to working further with you as we drive toward a truly long-term reauthorization. So thank you so much. I look forward to the dialogue here today. Thank you, Mr. Wolf. And uh, we recognize the rather quick pace that you set. So uh, we didn't want to stop that flow. So thank you so much. And thank you again for joining us this morning.
We have concluded opening statements from our first panel. We now will move to member questions. Each member will have five minutes to ask questions of our witness. I'll start by recognizing myself for five minutes. Um, so, Mr. Wolf, again, thank you for joining us. Uh, does the administration support a multi-year extension of the CPATS program? I mentioned in my opening statement the importance of going beyond risk management to promote actual risk reduction at these sites. American Institute of Chemical Engineers Center for Chemical Process Safety, which includes technical experts from chemical and oil companies, has produced risk reduction guidance to promote measures that minimize, substitute, moderate, or simplify hazardous processes. It seems to me that there is a growing acknowledgement, including by industry, of the importance of and opportunities for risk reduction as an essential component of site security. This might include actions like consolidating chemicals into fewer sites, substituting chemicals for less hazardous alternatives, and reducing the quantity of a chemical held on site. Do you believe these are potentially effective measures to reduce risk? Uh, I, I do, I, and I believe that CFATS has uh, effectively reduced risk. And uh, in fact, I think one of the, um, you know, one of the uh, success stories out of CFATS is the fact that upwards of 3,000 facilities over the course of the program's history have made risk-based decisions to either reduce their quantities of CFATS chemicals of interest, uh, eliminate those quantities, move to just-in-time delivery, uh, change their processes such that they're no longer considered high risk. So my belief is that CFATS kind of organically promotes those sorts of risk uh, decisions. Now, do you believe that additional risk reduction measures should be given significant consideration by facilities working to meet CFAS obligations? I, I certainly think it's a good thing for facilities to be considering risk. I think CFATS uh, does provide a, uh, a very solid framework for doing exactly that across 18 risk-based performance standards that kind of form the core of the, uh, of the program. Okay, and right now, these types of risk reduction measures are a potential option for some facilities. And I believe sites have taken these types of actions to fulfill CFAS requirements. Currently, how does the department actively encourage facilities to implement risk reduction measures? So our inspectors throughout the CFATS process work directly, as do, uh, as do many of our headquarters um, expert staff, work directly with facilities as they think through how to address the, uh, the 18 risk-based performance standards, so standards that cover um, an array of different risk reduction uh, measures, uh, measures designed to deter, detect, delay terrorist attack, measures focused on cybersecurity, measures focused on insider threat background checks, measures focused on response uh, and, uh, and training and exercises. So we consult um, as facilities um, develop their site security plans. Uh, we go back and forth uh, recognizing uh, as, uh, as, the, as the ranking member noted, that the CFATS community is a very diverse uh, group. So it's not a one-size-fits-all solution um, from facility to, uh, to facility. So we go back and forth, uh, work uh, with facilities as they determine which measures are most appropriate for them uh, to the point at which they uh, are determined to meet the intent of the, uh, each of the 18 risk-based performance standards. Now, you listed an array of potential risk reduction opportunities. Do you believe any one of those holds the most promise for additional um, work? Well, I, th I think the, uh, the beauty in many ways of the CFATS framework is that it is, it's non-prescriptive and it's, uh, it's flexible. So I think it really depends on the, uh, on the facility, um, you know, which area or areas are in need of most, uh, most focus. Uh, and we're able within the CFAS framework to work with those facilities to address you know, which, uh, which area or areas uh, need that focus on a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you. And while preserving flexibility in the program, can more be done to ensure facilities implementing or at the very least assessing potential risk reduction measures as part of their site security plans? Um, I think uh, a lot is being done uh, already, and uh, CFATS is very much already focused at those highest risk uh, facilities on working with the owners and operators and the security professionals um, on site at those facilities and in those, in those companies to reduce risk across those 18 risk-based performance standards. Well, we thank you for your testimony and your appearing before the subcommittee today. Chair will now recognize Mr. Shimkus, subcommittee ranking member, for five minutes to ask questions. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Again, Mr. Wolf, uh, thanks for being here. And to my colleagues on the subcommittee, this is really an, an important issue. Uh, it is driven from the terrorist attack, and uh, many of us have uh, in our districts facilities, chemical facilities. Um, so the, the, the balance is making sure that they are protected as much as possible. Um, and being, and I think our concern, and we, I think we all acknowledge the fact that we want to get as long-term reauthorization as we can. And I want to thank the chairman and uh, the ranking member for the work and scratching, <laughs> really, to get uh, whatever it was, 18 months. Um, we have a, a we have a problem with the Senate on this issue. And I think it's uh, the due diligence for us doing this right could help us overcome that. Having said that, we want, we want to continue to appreciate what's working and make sure that we don't, our position would be put so much on the plate that we start losing sight of, of, the, of the real goal and objective. And I, I really plead with my colleagues on the other side to help us find that uh, narrow path so that we can be really united as we address and, and fight with the Senate for the long-term authorization. Um, as a, so as a regulatory, a regulatory program with enforceable requirements, would IST-like requirements, inherently safer technology debate, which we've had in this committee <laughs> numerous times, be easy to understand and enforce? Um, I, I think as a prescriptive regulatory standard, it would not be a simple thing to, to do. And, and I think I raised this question um, maybe last time or in, in the numerous times we've been able to meet. Of the, uh, and I don't think we've gotten an answer back, how many of the facilities that have gone on through this evaluation have just decided to close? Um, I don't know that I have that number, but um, you know, have there been any? There have been facilities that right. have that have closed. I'm not I'm not certain that, that was as a direct result of CFATS. In fact, I'm I'm pretty certain not as a direct result of uh, of CFATS. Okay, I mean, we'll talk. We'll mention the other panel. See, cost benefit analysis, risk, additional costs, yeah. uh, current markets. It, it's really tough to say what causes a, a sector to decide to. Uh, to close and to move, um, but uh, that's a balance that, that, that we need to continue to address uh, with focus on safety. But if, if I mean, we just want to be careful that um, we don't drive uh, some good manufacturing in relatively safe areas in, in, in rural America, uh, out of rural America. Um, and. Uh, let me go to uh, ask about this, your, your intense effort to realign your risk meth methodology. Um, how difficult was that to do? Um, and proposals for changes, would that be uh, as difficult to redo? Yeah, so um, I appreciate that question. Uh, and we did, I think as you know, undertake a very intensive effort to uh, retool our risk tiering methodology. So kicked off uh, in the 2013 timeframe with an extensive peer review. We brought together uh, an expert panel composed of folks, from, experts from across uh, academia, uh, government partner agencies, uh, and industry to take a comprehensive look at our risk tiering methodology, which at the time was, uh, was pretty narrowly focused on the potential consequences of a terrorist attack and less so on vulnerabilities and threats. So after 18 months or so, that peer review panel came back with a series of very solid recommendations uh, and, um, and we set about um, working with a second external tiering review panel uh, similarly composed across, uh, across those communities um, to, um, to bounce ideas for building bounce ideas off of for building a new and improved risk tiering methodology that 
fully accounts for all relevant uh, elements of risk. And that's exactly what we did and we set about re-tiering the universe of facilities from beginning to end. It was about a five-year process. Yeah, so thanks. Let me uh, make sure I, I put this in the record that uh, this, this relationship with uh, DHS is because we're, we're focused on security and we want to put that, make sure that's on the table. And just for my colleagues, the initial rollout of this program was a little tumultuous and challenging and with the GAO report, and that caused us to really get involved in looking deeply at this. And again, Mr. Wolf was able to help write the ship, and we thank him for that. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes Representative Peters for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Wolf, for being here today. Um, I note there are about 3,400 chemical facilities in the United States, 350 are in California, three are in San Diego, um, and of the 3,400, 3,321 are high risk. And so I think that there's a general consensus that this is a program that needs to be re-upped. I thought, um, I think that that's, um, um, that's pretty clear, uh, so that's a big step. Are you familiar with the, uh, the particular bill that came out of Homeland Security, are you familiar with that draft? I am a little bit familiar with it, yeah. Uh, do you have, does the administration or do you personally have issues with that bill that you'd like to see changed or are you okay with it, do you think? So I, I think the, um, I think what we are concerned most about um, is that we achieve a long-term authorization for the, uh, for the program, as you noted, and that bill would afford us a five-year um, period of authorization. Um, you know, I'm happy to discuss individual um, proposals in the bill here today, but you know, from our perspective, getting to that long-term authorization is the absolute highest, uh, highest priority. Yeah, and so you're, f five years is a, is a good number of, of years, you think? Or you I feel like, like maybe a zero is missing. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, 0 0.5. But five is a good start. Uh, okay, five thank you. Start. I get it, okay. So, um, well, that's helpful, actually. Uh, let me just ask you a specific question. On the next panel, um, one of the uh, people who will be appearing is uh, Mr. John Paul Smith on the United Steelworkers. I want to read you a quote, see if you have an issue with this. Reauthorization should include a requirement for CFATS facilities to generate, document, and effectively transmit actionable chemical and process information to, uh, including employees and their union representatives at self-responding facilities. DHS should also be required to generate, distribute, and make publicly available the practices facilities have used to tier out or tear down in the program. This information sharing is critical to ensure that risks are not just being shifted and so that other facilities can use those lessons across the industry to reduce risks and hazard. Do you have an opinion or anything you want to say about that? Is that something you agree with, disagree with, or is not? Not important to the administration. Yeah, I, I think, uh, broadly speaking, uh, with respect to information sharing, uh, this is a security-focused um, program. So we need to strike the continue to strike the correct balance um, between sharing, ensuring that we're able to share information with those who have a need to know that information. So law enforcement, first responders, um, you know, uh, emergency planners who are charged with protecting our uh, our communities. Uh, and ensuring that we don't provide a roadmap, that we don't right. um, distribute information so widely that it does become available to those who would seek to, uh, to do us harm. Um, you know, that list of, uh, of folks with whom information should be shared also includes employees with a security, um, you know, a security background who uh, can contribute to the development of a facility site security plan. Uh, with respect to the sharing of best practices uh, across the uh, across the universe of chemical facilities, uh, I think that is a, a good thing. Uh, it's uh, you know certainly something uh, we can uh, talk some more about and work uh, work toward. But best practices that have been put in place by uh, by companies under CFATS to to uh, to improve security, we absolutely want to share those to the greatest extent possible with other chemical facilities. Great and and. As far as today, you're not, you, you don't have a particular objections or suggestions for this draft bill to accommodate those concerns, or do you? Uh, well, I, th I think we're in a good place yeah. actually ar already, um, as is with the uh, with the program with respect to being able to uh, you know continue with that appropriate balance between sharing of information and protecting uh, inf sensitive information from the prying eyes of our, our adversaries, uh, and already certainly have, uh, have authority to, uh, to share information across the, uh, across the community of chemical facilities. 
Great. Anything else you'd like to tell us about this draft before we hear from the next panel? Uh, 50 years would be uh, 50 would be years, awesome. okay. Awesome. Okay, thank you very much. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes Representative McKinley for five minutes. Sorry, I didn't realize that I was going to follow or proceed her. Um, what I'd like to know um, is, is firstly, have, have there been any incidents since this has been put in place, have, challenges to the system that have been caught as a result of the risk assessment? Um, I, I Terrorist attacks? Yeah, terrorist attacks, yeah. Um, no, uh, I mean, I, I, I firmly believe that uh, CFAT's program has effectively hardened uh, those 3,300 high-risk facilities as, uh, as targets. Um, so, no, we have not seen a, uh, a okay. terrorist attack. Secondly, uh, we have apparently, we have uh, 21 uh, uh, high-risk uh, facilities in West Virginia. Uh, are any of those in Tier 1 or Tier 2? Uh, I would have to get that information back to you, but my uh, my initial inclination would be to say yes. You, your yours would be what? Uh, I, I I believe so, but I will have to confirm that. Uh, that's what I've been given the impression that, that we may have some that would fall into that category. Uh, one of the one of the concerns that I share with this is that the um, this area in northern West Virginia, particularly, is, is uh, embarking on quite a petrochemical uh, complex of buildings and, and industries that's going to be popping up as a result of the shale gas and, and the location of the cracker facility in Monaco, Pennsylvania, and possibly one in Ohio. So we're seeing there's going to be quite an influx of businesses that are going to be in the chemical business uh, in northern West Virginia. I'm curious to see the advantage of making a change at this point and how this work. If it's been successful to date, that's what I'm trying to understand, the value. What, what do you think is behind having this, list? other than extending? I'd like to see it extended, but, but making changes to the program. What, what can you share with us some the value in making the changes? Um, you know, I, I do think that CFAS provides a very solid uh, framework um, now, it is a flexible framework, so we are able to uh, stay ahead <laughs> of the continually evolving uh, threat curve. I uh, do very much uh, appreciate the work that has been done in the, uh, in the Committee on Homeland Security. Uh, you know, we see that bill as a, as a very important uh, first step toward long-term uh, reauthorization, but that uh, remains our, uh, you know, our key goal is is ensuring that long-term reauthorization. So you have, program. and I think I, I picked up enough from your, your testimony and some of the responses some of the others have said that they're, they're sharing this data, uh, does that put it more at risk by putting this thing information out? Um, sharing, sharing sensitive. Because we all know that we know that any of us that have said it on enough briefings, we know, we know people are hacking into our systems or they're paying attention to what we're talking about. If we start identifying and sharing information back and forth, that, that means that information is going to be exposed to the bad actors around the world. So to help me out a little bit understanding the value of why we want to make that change. Yeah, so I think we would not like to see much of any change on the information sharing front. Uh, we want to retain the flexibility to have that balance, um, to be able to share information with those who have a need to know, who are charged with protecting uh, our communities. Um, but to ensure that we keep that sensitive information, and that's the reason we have within CFATS a chemical terrorism vulnerability information protection regime to keep that sensitive information out away from the eyes but, of but, our adversaries. But you don't have a problem necessarily with the whistleblower aspect of it, strengthening the whistleblower concept? Um, I think uh, we, have, we have whistleblower provisions uh, already. Maybe tighten it up, that, you know, the yeah, concept. I think uh, I, where we are very much, uh, you know, open to opportunities to tighten up the, uh, the whistleblower so, so language. Where, so and and I, would, I would say too, I'm sorry, uh, you know, there are other things we can, for which we would need, for, for which additional uh, tweaks might be helpful, the ability to execute a, a petition process to sort of more effectively be able to look at products um, that might pose less risk uh, and to potentially uh, could, let them could, out could of you, the program. Can you share some of that information with us on how we might tweak this if, if you think yeah. that 
yeah. uh, other than the, what we've already testified to. If you yeah. can get that to Abs our office, I'd like to take a look Absolutely. at that. Absolutely. And uh, you know, on that front as well, and I noted in my opening statement, the ability um, to um, be able to use our chemical security inspectors uh, not only to implement the, uh, the regulation with respect to those highest risk facilities, and I think that continuing narrow focus for CFATS is important, um, but to be able to work on a voluntary basis um, with those other 30,000 facilities would be helpful to us as well. Thank you very much. I look forward to getting the list, uh, if you could, of the, of the ones in West Virginia. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes Representative Blunt Rochester for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all of the witnesses today. Um, it is such an important day. Um, I had to step out to meet with representatives from our Delaware uh, VFW, and I think all of us can remember where we were on September 11th. Um, I was head of state personnel for the state of Delaware at the time, so there was a lot of concern about what would happen to employees. There were a lot of concern about communities and schools and Dover Air Force Base. And um, I, I am reminded of how important the role of Congress is and how important your role is in ensuring that Americans are protected. Um, it, it, it means something, and especially today. And um, so I have a, a few questions, just a few. Um, one, um, you mentioned getting rid of the backlog of, for inspections. Can you talk a little bit about that, what you did, how you did it? Yeah, so I, I appreciate that question. Um, we, at, at one point, had a very significant backlog of facility site security plan reviews and approvals. GAO projected that it would take us up to nine years to eliminate that backlog. So that was uh, during the early days of the program. We were getting our legs under us. We had some process uh, issues. Um, we rolled up our sleeves. We have a great team. Um, uh, within, the, uh, within the program, we retrained our, uh, our workforce, we eliminated bottlenecks, and we were able to eliminate that backlog nearly six years ahead of those, uh, those earlier GAO projections. So you had the uh, right amount of resources in terms of dollars, you, did, you had the right workforce, um, you didn't have any challenges there, and do you foresee any as you move forward? Yeah, we have a, a very highly qualified workforce. We, have enjoyed and continue to enjoy great support uh, from uh, within the, uh, the department. Uh, the, my, my second uh, set of questions are really just related to, um, in your testimony, I didn't see uh, much about engagement of local communities um, and even like relatively minor release of chemicals from uh, tampering could have uh, an effect on communities, um, serious ramifications, especially for vulnerable populations or hospitals or senior homes. Um, can you describe or detail um, the work that you at DHS uh, currently do to bring community and stakeholders into the process? Uh, sure, no, I am, I am glad to and I appreciate that question uh, as well. Uh, certainly the reason that CFATS exists uh, is to protect our communities, to protect the American public uh, from the threat of, uh, of terrorist attack on facilities that might cause a, a release of a chemical into surrounding facility or the theft or diversion of a chemical uh, to be deployed in an attack um, off-site away, uh, away from the facility. Uh, and so we absolutely prioritize getting information um, to those who are charged with protecting those, uh, those communities. So law enforcement, first responders, emergency planners. Uh, we have done extensive outreach uh, with local emergency planning committees to uh, ensure that they are aware of the, uh, of the CFATS program. Uh, and again, to share um, with cleared members of those communities, those who do have that need to know um, sensitive information on CFATS. So I think that's part of the challenge is defining need to know and who needs to know. And, and um, you talked about the shared commitment, and I know you just referenced uh, many stakeholders, um, but one of my questions is how do you balance that, uh, n not just the need to know for law enforcement, but community advocates? Um, and, and could you tell us if you have any plans to increase um, those in affected communities in the planning process? Yeah, so uh, we certainly include um, within the uh, realm of those who have a need to know 
um, emergency planners uh, who plan on behalf of those local, uh, local jurisdictions for emergencies. And within the CFATS program, within our 18 risk-based performance standards, uh, we have one RBPS 9 focused on response. And with respect to release facilities, facilities that pose a threat of release of a chemical into the surrounding community, one of the requirements we place on, um, on covered facilities is the requirement to reach out um, to uh, local communities, to members of public, to ensure that they have awareness of shelter-in-place protocols and that sort of thing. So I think that's an important way in which we engage the community within CFATS. I'm currently um, working on legislation that um, will focus on community notification, and so we would love to follow up on this conversation. Um, you know, we talk about um, need to know, and I think it's really important to drill down deeper. Some of the testimony that may be coming later references the fact that sometimes communities are confused and things are not clear to them. And so I think it, it, as we move forward, if we can have some dialogue about that, um, I thank you and I yield back my time. The general lady yields back. The chair now recognizes Representative Johnson for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Wolf. Thank you for uh, being here again today to talk about this very important program. You know, it, it's imperative that we all understand this program and especially understand the impact that the proposed changes in HR 3256 will have on CFATS. Uh, we can't produce a bill that creates unintended consequences. Nobody wants to do that. So your participation is, at, is very much appreciated. Um, a topic at our last CFATS hearing was improving training for compliance inspections and enforcement. Can you briefly tell us what steps DHS has taken to improve in this area? Sure, and no, I am glad to appreciate the, uh, appreciate the question. Uh, so we very highly prioritize training for our, uh, our workforce. Um, we continue to operate uh, you know, a, a robust training program. It includes basic training for all of our new inspectors. It includes advanced training um, for our inspector cadre on topics such as cybersecurity, uh, on topics such as the personnel surety, uh, surety program. Uh, and more recently, uh, we have initiated, or we have established a, uh, a, a core of senior inspectors across the country. So these are folks who are in place uh, to provide um, not only on-the-job training uh, for our inspectors to serve in sort of a mentorship role, um, but to focus on um, building and ensuring that we have a consistent approach as we work with facilities uh, across the uh, country. Uh, and um, on that front as well, we've recently established an audit program. So we are internally looking at our own uh, actions. We are auditing our inspections. Uh, we are generating best practices to share uh, among our, uh, among and across our inspector core, uh, and you know, identifying areas where we may need some improvement. As okay. Well. All right. Does DHS have minimum qualification requirements for inspectors to demonstrate their knowledge and understanding of the facilities they encounter and relevant guidance on enforceable requirements? Yeah, absolutely we do. So those inspectors um, you know, need to get through the, uh, the basic and advanced training. Um, there are exams at the, end of the, uh, at the end of the training. There are basic requirements um, to be selected um, to, be, to become a chemical security uh, inspector. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have, uh, as a result, uh, a, a very talented uh, workforce. We have folks with vast experience across military, law enforcement, Let, chemical yeah. industry, among many, Let, uh, many Let's others. dig into that a little bit, because we've talked about training, but what types of professional development exist for these auditors and inspectors to, to stay proficient on industry you know, new developments and that kind of stuff. So there's that on-the-job training, that sort of internal training, but um, we um, ensure that our inspectors are active members of, uh, of relevant, um, relevant associations and uh, have access to those resources. So I, earlier this week, was at the uh, annual uh, Global Security Exchange uh, put on by the, uh, the American Society of Industrial Security. So we have membership for all our inspectors. Uh, in that organization, they're all part of the local uh, local chapters, able to be part of that network and and uh, able to be plugged in and to stay on the leading edge of evolving. Uh, are there are there continuing education requirements or anything like that? Do you do you require them to go to any kind of seminars in their uh, in their specific uh, uh, 
yeah. we, we, areas of concentration? We manage that internally. So we okay. develop uh, we develop training on, for instance, advanced cybersecurity okay. and require right. that that uh, members who are who have the uh, sort of certification to engage uh, with the more complex uh, okay. cyber cases. All right, I, and I know this has been touched on a little bit already. You know, some people argue that greater public sharing of chemical vulnerability information is necessary for communities to be better protected. And, and I know you know that CVI is used to protect uh, information developed under CFATS regulations that relate to vulnerabilities of high-risk chemical facilities that possess chemicals of interest for terrorist attacks. So, uh, Mr. Wolf, is it wise to have CVI uh, publicly available? Um, no, I do not believe it uh, makes good sense from a security perspective to have uh, have CVI information, the most sensitive information about high-risk chemical facilities, available to general members of members of the general public. Okay. All right, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back an entire eight seconds. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the uh, chair of the full committee, Representative Pallone, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Tonko. The CFATS program is different from other regulatory programs overseen by this subcommittee, and that's different because it's implemented by your department rather than the EPA, and because it does not have the same public recognition as landmark environmental laws that protect the public from contaminants in our air, our drinking water, our soil. And while this program is just as important to keeping the public safe, it's far less accessible and transparent to the public than other programs. And when we reauthorized the program in 2014, the law included a requirement that the department prepare an outreach implementation plan for stakeholder engagement. You publish an outreach plan for fiscal year 2019, so I wanted to ask a few questions about that. Uh, first, how have you engaged workers and their representatives uh, under the outreach plan? And uh, what mechanisms are in place to ensure that employees play a role in the implementation of, of CFATS? So uh, I appreciate that. Um, we certainly, as we conduct uh, outreach, and we very much prioritize outreach to all of our stakeholder communities, we think awareness of the CFATS program uh, is very important to its success. Uh, we include uh, in that, uh, that outreach uh, efforts to uh, maintain open lines of communication with, uh, with labor organizations at the national level. And on a facility-by-facility -facility basis, um, you know, we, um, we require that uh, facilities, as, as, um, as noted in the, uh, in the existing uh, legislation, um, to the greatest extent practical, uh, uh, engage uh, employees with relevant security-focused uh, expertise in developing their site security plans. And that certainly includes employees uh, of, uh, of bargaining units uh, with the relevant expertise at those uh, at those facilities. So as our inspectors go out and conduct inspections uh, at those facilities, compliance inspections at those facilities, they're talking to employees. They're talking to members of the relevant bargaining unit about their role um, in the security plan, about their role in the facility's security. Um, and, what, and what about community groups and community members around the regulated facilities? Does the department engage them as well? Uh, so we do, uh, and uh, we, uh, within CFATS and with respect to facilities that pose a threat of release, uh, as, I, as I mentioned a little earlier, uh, we require facilities to do that community outreach to discuss things such as shelter in place um, protocols, and you know, we're engaged. I have personally participated in community meetings um, with, uh, with members of the community who, um, who live in areas close to, a, uh, close to CFATS covered facilities, uh, and you know, we strive to be as open and transparent as we possibly can be, recognizing, of course, that this is a security-focused program, and we want to strike the right balance um, between sharing information with those who have that need to know and keeping that information away from those who would do us. All right, I've got to get to the climate issue, but can I just ask about Native American tribes? Are they involved in developing and implementing uh, CFATS? Just uh, yeah. Absolutely, and uh, one thing I neglected to uh, to mention in my response is that we have very much prioritized outreach to local emergency planning 
uh, committees. So more than 800 of those committees in the, uh, in the last year. Uh, and uh, as well, tribal uh, emergency response commissions. So absolutely included in that, uh, in that mix. And you know, very important that we get the word out about CFATS to those. I mean, obviously, I, I want to make sure all stakeholder voices are heard. And I find it, it bothers me when the department talks about the stakeholders, but seems to be referring to the regulated facilities, because we do have to hear from the public. So I appreciate what you said. I just wanted to spend a minute on the serious concerns posed by these facilities because of climate change and increasing extreme weather. Uh, can you tell me how many CFATS facilities approximately are vulnerable to extreme weather events? I think you could argue that, um, you know, that we're all potentially vulnerable to, uh, to weather events. Okay. And when Hurricane Harvey struck Houston, historic flooding impacted chemical facilities across that region. At one facility, the Arkema plant in Crosby, the flooding disabled all the control measures in place to contain their dangerous chemicals because they all depended on backup generators below the waterline. Can you tell me how many CFATS facilities approximately have evaluated how their security systems would fare in an extreme weather event. And then I guess also how many facilities have provisions on their site security plans to ensure that their target chemicals remain secure, even in extreme weather. Yeah. You only got about half a minute, yeah. but whatever. I, I, I will take my best, uh, my best shot All at right. it. Uh, you know, so CFATS, um, which is focused, I think, appropriately on uh, the security of high-risk chemical facilities, uh, you know, includes provisions to ensure that security systems um, are uh, appropriately redundant, that there uh, does exist backup um, power for, say, closed circuit TV cameras and other, uh, other security systems. So I would say that, you know, all of our CFATS covered facilities have had that discussion and have put in place uh, those sorts of redundancies that, although put in place for the, the CFATS anti-terrorism security focused purpose, uh, have ancillary benefits um, when there is a, a weather event. All right, thank you. Of course. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The uh, chairman yields back. The chair now recognizes Representative Duncan for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> back in 2014, when the CFATS was authorized by Congress, I sat on the Homeland Security Committee. So I remember the debates back then. Also, sitting here listening to the conversations this morning, on the 18th anniversary of the 9-11 terrorist attacks on our country. I can't help but think about why the Department of Homeland Security was stood up in the first place. And that was because we had a lot of agencies of the federal government working independently, sharing or not sharing information, stovepiping of that information, protecting their turf, their fiefdoms. And so we decided to put the security concerns of our nation into one department, the Department of Homeland Security, to focus on areas that need to be protected and hedged against terrorist attacks of the future. I think protecting our chemical facilities that could be vulnerable to terrorist attacks is important. We talk with a lot of chemical companies uh, in our state about these issues and did back in the early 2011, 12, 13, 14, before CFATS was passed. Mr. Wolf, I think um, there's an importance of maintaining a focus on site security. EPA plays a role when there's a chemical spill. OSHA plays a role when there are worksite accidents or sets forth guidelines for the protection of the employees at facilities around the country. That's, that's their role, that's their mission. Safety and hazard protection in the workplace and environmental protection if there's a chemical spill or the possibility of a chemical spill. Putting guidelines in place to keep um, rail cars or chemical facilities, 55-gallon um, drums from being uh, subject to spills and contaminating the environment. The Department of Homeland Security has a mission, and that is to keep me and you my fellow Americans safe from terrorist attacks. That's their role, that's why they were stood up. But now we're gonna bring two more agencies into that role, and I'm fearful that we have gotten away from the lessons learned after 9-11. And that is the stovepiping of information, the failure to share information between agencies because of turf battles. 
Come on, folks. 18 years ago, we learned these lessons. We're going to talk about climate change with regard to chemical safety? My gosh. We're talking about keeping us safe from terrorist attacks. Mr. Wolf, I appreciate you being here. Your perspective, um, from your perspective, DHS, why is it so important to avoid diluting the CFATS program's mission? Yeah, and I appreciate, I appreciate the question. And, uh, you know, we uh, feel it's important to retain a focus on security. That is our mission at the Department of... Uh, of You're not trying to protect your turf at, at Homeland Security, are you? We are not. We are You're trying to protect Americans. Absolutely right. It's an anti-terrorism uh, anti program. The threat is as real and as relevant as it ever has been. It is as high as it has ever been from a chemical terrorism perspective. It continues to evolve into you know, realms such as uh, unmanned aircraft systems, cyber, uh, cyber attacks, um, and uh, insider threat and, uh, and beyond. And I feel as though we do need to maintain within the CFATS program kind of a laser focus on security. And with CFATS, we are talking about um, America's highest risk chemical facilities. It's a targeted program, I think appropriately, uh, appropriately so. Uh, and it's been a successful program. So we do not want to take our eye off that ball. I appreciate that. How's uh, further expanding the program in environmental and worker space? Safety space deviating from the CFATS mission. So uh, CFATS is a security uh, is a security program. So the 18 risk-based performance standards are focused on uh, on securing facilities against terrorist uh, attacks. As I as I noted a few minutes ago, there are ancillary benefits uh, in the you know, in. Uh, in terms of reducing risk uh, in weather uh, weather scenarios, but you know our 150 chemical security inspectors are security professionals. Uh, they are trained and well equipped uh, to work with facilities to put in place uh, security measures, and that's what our that's what our program is here to, here's to, here to do. It's a it's a small program, um, but it is a successful one. Yeah. Well, thank you for that, and I just urge us to keep our eye on the ball and understand again, why the Homeland Security uh, Agency was stood up to protect us against terrorist attacks, not to protect us against chemical spills, accidents in the workplace, whatever, we have agencies to deal with that. This is about protecting the chemical facilities from terrorist attacks. We're reminded at 18 year anniversary of 9-11, we ought to keep our eye on the ball of keeping America safe without a yield back. Gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes Representative Soto for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Acting Deputy Assistant Director Wolf, how far along are we on securing our chemical facilities uh, since the beginning of 2007 uh, through now? Uh, we are uh, we are well along, and I think in a very good place. As as uh, as discussed earlier, um, we eliminated that backlog of site security plan reviews and approvals, and we are very much in sort of steady state for the program. So the vast majority of uh, inspections we're conducting across the country are the post-site security plan approval compliance inspection variety of inspections. Uh, and I will say those inspections are going well. Uh, you know, on, on occasion, issues are noted, but they are uh, typically very quickly um, resolved. Uh, we have tremendous commitment. We have tremendous buy-in across our industry stakeholder uh, community. And I can tell you absolutely those those high-risk chemical facilities, those 3,300 or so, are hardened uh, against terrorist attack. Tens of thousands of security measures have been put into place at those facilities, and on average, um, CFAT's covered facility has increased security um, uh, to the tune of 55% from the point at which the facility enters into the program to the point at which I sign uh, their site security plan approval and they enter into that regular cycle of compliance inspection activity. So just so we're clear, all major chemical facilities in the nation now are under this purview and are being maintained and uh, get continual respect inspections. So CFATS is a targeted program, and I think that is, uh, that's appropriate. Uh, we're focused on the highest risk facilities. So about 30,000 facilities um, across the country have recognized that they have threshold quantities of CFATS chemicals of interest. Uh, and have submitted what we call a top screen report to initiate the risk assessment process through which we determine which facilities are at high risk. 
So about 10% of facilities are determined by us to be at high risk of terrorist attack or exploitation. We put those facilities into risk tiers, tiers one through four, uh, highest of the high risk to lowest of the high risk, but still high risk. Uh, and it's with those facilities that we work to develop site security plans and to put them through the regular cycle of compliance inspection activity. I noted earlier that we have those other 30,000 facilities out there. Uh, we would like very much to work with those facilities as well on a voluntary basis, um, you know, at those facilities, complete option, not, not on a regulatory basis, not extending the regulatory requirements to those facilities, uh, but being able to lend a helping hand to consult uh, on, uh, on potential security measures, uh, to consult um, regarding potential vulnerabilities. So I think um, that is an important next step uh, for us from a chemical securities perspective, but we are in a, we're in a very good place with respect to those high risk uh, chemical facilities. In the proposed legislation, subsection F, it re requires the Department of Homeland Security to share more information with state and local emergency officials. And, you know, it's been 18 years uh, since the 9-11 terrorist attacks. I, I have a first responder who was uh, Vivian Rodriguez in my own office who was there uh, responding to that. We have a lot of retired NYPD in Central Florida. I think that shouldn't surprise anybody. Uh, I've heard firsthand that they were told that the air was safe uh, after the attack. And uh, we saw obviously a large loss of life because government agencies said that it, our first responders were safe during the cleanup. So with this, with the current law and with the new proposals, Homeland Security and other agencies responsible should a chemical facility, God forbid, be attacked, they would be working with our local officials to let them know whether the air was safe, let them know whether the, the water around and other facilities were safe so we can, so we won't have this happen again. Is that fair to say, given the current law and the reforms in this bill? So I, I um, you know, my sense is that those are areas within the domain of our friends at, uh, at EPA. But Homeland is supposed to be the point on a lot of these things. So you'll be working with EPA. So. Would, would this bill help make sure that our first responders and others would be told if the air wasn't safe to breathe or other aspects, given that you all are there to coordinate when we have a terrorist attack among the agencies? Yeah, I, I would have to take a closer look at the, uh, at the bill. Um, my sense is that it, it doesn't contain provisions that would, that would do that with respect to our security-focused anti-terrorism um, program, but I will say that within the CFATS program, we continue to prioritize that outreach. We continue to prioritize sharing of information about CFATS covered facilities um, with those community, with, with those emergency planners, with law enforcement, with first responders who are charged with protecting um, the public. Well, obviously, we never want that to happen again. So, a big issue. We hope to hear back from you soon on that. The uh, gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes Representative Rogers for. Five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank both the panels for being here today. Securing our critical infrastructure from terror attacks is vital, and we are especially reminded of that today on this important anniversary, 9-11. The FIFATS program has been instrumental in ensuring chemical facilities at risk of terror attacks are protected. As we consider reauthorization of this crucial program, I'm interested in making sure we are particularly focused on ensuring DHS can effectively implement its core mission under this program, protecting our vulnerable chemical infrastructure from acts of terrorism and intentional attacks. Mr. Wolf, last June you appeared before us for three hours to discuss DHS, DHS's efforts to correct the CFAX program identified deficiencies. Have any new program deficiencies been discovered and what are you doing about them? And uh, thank you for the uh, thank you for the question. Um, so recently, um, well, within the last uh, last couple of years, uh, GAO uh, conducted a comprehensive review of the uh, of the CFATS program. Uh, it uh, had only a couple of recommendations, noting broadly that the program uh, has been successful, that we have made uh, had made significant uh, significant improvements, and really we're clicking on uh, on all cylinders. Uh, the, the couple of recommendations focused on defining metrics 
for success, uh, how we could measure the effectiveness of the program and the reduction uh, in a vulnerability of facilities. Uh, and we, uh, we took that on uh, and we're able now to, uh, to measure the uh, extent of improvement uh, in a facility's security posture over the course of the program. And that's that 55% uh, average improvement um, in security at CFAT's covered facilities. Uh, the second finding was focused on outreach to local emergency planning committees, and we undertook to redouble our outreach efforts in those regards, uh, reaching to more than 800 uh, LEPCs across the country. Uh, in, uh, we actually hit within the last year or so uh, local emergency planning committees uh, for all counties that had five or more CFATS covered facilities. And over the course of the program's history, literally thousands and thousands of outreach engagements with local emergency planning committees. Um, no other deficiencies have been, uh, have been identified. Um, as noted, we have, uh, we have addressed, uh, confronted head-on uh, areas where we thought improvement was necessary. We retooled that risk tiering methodology. We eliminated that site security plan review and approval backlog. We're in steady state for the program. Uh, we are conducting inspections. They're going well. Uh, the, the tar the, the uh, facilities covered under our program are really and truly hard targets and owes very much to the, uh, to the hard work, uh, not only of our, uh, our dedicated team, um, but companies across the, uh, the country uh, that have embraced the program and that have put in place CFAT's focused security measures. Okay. Uh, so, thank you. Sorry for um, the no, uh, uh, so, so what type of quality control has been established to uh, catch these problems earlier on in yeah. the future? One of the things we have done is to put in place an internal audit um, program. So we are sending uh, some of our own senior personnel along on inspections uh, to audit them and to uh, identify where issue, you know, in the event issues uh, arise, in the event there are things we can be doing better um, to, uh, to address those uh, and to identify where things are going well and to ensure that we're able to foster consistency uh, on a national basis uh, across our 10 regions so that, um, that facilities in California experience a CFATS uh, inspection the same way as facilities in, uh, in New York. Uh, so we have done that. We have put in place a cadre of uh, senior inspectors who are also charged with on a day-to-day -day basis ensuring that we are, um, that we're acting consistently across the country and providing on-the-job training uh, to our inspectors to ensure that the latest and greatest in terms of program guidance, policy guidance, uh, is disseminated and taken in across our, uh, across our workforce. Okay. Earlier this year, Congress narrowly avoided having the authority for the entire CFATS program disappear. Previously, the CFATS program had been operating on a four-year authorization. What's the difference between managing a program with a very short authorization and one with a longer lead time? Thank you. Well, I, I guess I've done both. Uh, and I will say that when we're on a short-term situation, and you could argue that this 15-month extension uh, is, uh, is sort of that, um, our team spends a lot more time uh, up here um, with you all focusing on getting long-term um, reauthorization. Um, but uh, substantively, long-term uh, authorization offers us a stability that is so important for moving the, uh, the program forward. You know, it's the stability that enables us to make improvements that has enabled us to do things like, uh, like enhance the risk tiering methodology and eliminate that backlog and put in place um, online systems that reduce burden among many, many other things. It provides certainty for our industry stakeholders as they think about making capital investments in, uh, in security. It sends a message to those who might seek to avoid their obligations under CFATS that the program isn't going anywhere, that it's here to stay. Uh, and it's super helpful from a morale uh, standpoint in terms of our ability to recruit and retain the best and the brightest. Super. Thank you. Thank, thank you for your leadership. Of course. No, thank you. The uh, general lady yields back. The chair now recognizes Representative Ruiz for five minutes, please. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing on such an important topic. Uh, Mr. Wolf, in your testimony, you talked about the rapidly changing threat environment that sensitive chemical facilities are facing. One unique aspect of that changing landscape I'd like to touch on is cybersecurity. Uh, you see, we think of threats in terms of physical attacks, uh, leakage, thefts, assaults, vandalism, but in the digital age, 
that we live in, bad actors armed with a keyboard can cause extremely high levels of damage or act as an accomplice to those who may be seeking to gain access to harmful chemicals. Can you give me the worst case scenarios in one of these uh, facilities where a uh, cyber security vulnerability manipulation attack and what can it pose to uh, to the facility and to um, to the surrounding communities? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I suppose that in the worst case scenario where a facility has cyber systems that are um, you know, pretty fully integrated with its uh, industrial control systems, with its chemical process systems, uh, that a you know cyber attacker could um, could work to um, to manipulate those processes, potentially you know causing a a release of uh, of chemicals. Um, you know, where cyber systems are integrated with business process systems, uh, you know, a cyber attack could seek to divert a shipment of, uh, of chemicals or something, uh, something along those lines. In, in the required reporting of vulnerability assessments and site security plans, is cybersecurity specifically a, a, a reporting requirement for those facilities? Uh, it is, so cybersecurity, um, um, comprises one of our 18 risk-based performance standards. The CFATS program, I think, was very much out front um, with respect to cybersecurity, so risk-based performance standard eight um, is focused on cyber. Our inspectors uh, engage in discussion uh, during inspections and in the process of, of working with facilities as they develop their site security. One of the biggest concerns that we have as a nation is the lack of cybersecurity experts to fill those spots. Uh, there's their studies have shown that we have a cybersecurity shortage in the workforce. Uh, and so we're looking into ways that we can help beef that up. Uh, let me talk to you about another, uh, another issue that uh, has been mentioned by Ranking Member Pallone in terms of consulting with the surrounding communities. Uh, the majority of these locations are around communities, like you said, that are minority or uh, underserved. And uh, there's a, a quote here from the Environmental Protection Agency that says, catastrophic accidents at chemical facilities, historically about 150 each year, can result in fatalities, serious injuries, evacuations, and other harm to health and human health. Uh, we heard earlier that 134,000 people live around those areas. Uh, this is particularly concerning to me uh, because this is an environmental justice issue. So you mentioned earlier that you consult with surrounding communities. I'd like to go a little more specific in that. How do you do it? How do you decide with which community, when, how frequent, and with who do you consult with? Yeah. Give me an example. Yeah, so an example would be, you know, any one of the thousands of uh, outreach engagements we've held with. What are those persons? outreach engagements? Is it a a uh, newspaper article, is it a, uh, how do you engage specifically? So it will be plugging in to a, you know, in person to a local emergency planning committee meeting and talking there to. Like or, with who? Because oftentimes in these under-resourced communities, rural areas, they don't have the technical assistance. So who are exactly are you reaching out to? Are you reaching out to the city mayor? Are you reaching out to the environmental justice community stakeholders? Who, who exactly and how are you doing it? See, the problem is that we've, we've learned from different examples that the federal government oftentimes has a check the box kind of attitude where if they send a letter to somebody that might not have actual uh, uh, connections with the community, they've checked the box and say, and say we've engaged. But that's but we're trying to redefine what meaningful engagement, meaningful consultation is, uh, so that communities actually have a voice and a say and a participation to help you mitigate risks. And also, if there is a risk, who's responsible for cleaning it up? Is there any provision where the community can go to the chemical facilities and and uh, and ask for uh, uh, compensation for the uh, environmental or health uh, uh, damage that can result from these leaks, potential leaks? Yeah. So I would uh, I would say um, that there's a lot to unpack there, but we certainly do not um, pursue a check the box approach to outreach engagement with uh, with communities and with local emergency planning committees in particular. So we send uh, inspectors who work in those communities, who work uh, in those regions, to engage personally. 
Uh, and those LEPCs can include not only emergency responders from the community, um, law enforcement, and other, but members of the uh, members of the public as well, the news media in uh, in some instances. So we are out there in person, and we've made that a uh, a very high. At the next priority. panel, we have some environmental justice stakeholders, and I'm curious to see what they what they say about that as well. Thank you. Of course. The uh, gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes Representative Flores for five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Tonko and Leader Shimkus, uh, we appreciate uh, holding this important hearing today. Uh, Mr. Wolf, thank you for appearing again today, and welcome back to the committee. Uh, Reauthorizing CFATS is important to me and, and to my district, which includes the community of West of Texas. Uh, since our last hearing in June of 2018, I'm pleased to report that we were able to extend CFATS through April 2020, ensuring that the program does not expire as we work on a long-term solution. And as you've heard earlier, I am among the group that has strong concerns regarding the recent partisan bill that came out of the Homeland Security Committee. That said, I'm hopeful that we can uh, still work together to find consensus on a bipartisan bill that can also pass the Senate and be sent to President Trump's desk uh, for signature. I'd like to thank uh, all the witnesses on both panels for providing their uh, perspectives. Mr. Wolf, uh, questions about the personal surety or the identity verification processes against the uh, terrorist screening base have constantly been an issue with CFADS. Now that you've finished with the highest risk, high risk facilities or tiers one and two, uh, DHS is now implementing these requirements at the tier three and tier four facilities. How is this new universe of facilities different than the highest risk facilities in terms of uh, sizes and challenges? So uh, I appreciate that question. And I would say the, uh, the biggest difference is in the size of the population. So tier one and two facilities with which we've worked over the last, uh, last three years to implement terrorist ties vetting um, pose about 10% of our regulated uh, population, um, but um, the other 90% falls within tiers three and four. So that's about 3,000 um, additional facilities uh, with which we'll be working over the next, uh, next three years to ensure that, and I think this is important, that um, they know uh, and uh, have the assurance that those who have access to their facilities, to those high-risk chemical facilities and the critical assets on those facilities have been vetted for terrorist ties. Okay. Uh, as you know, you had to get through the tier one and tier two facilities and, and a backlog build up. You were able to resolve the backlog uh, with respect to personal surety verification. How do you, um, how does DHS intend to expand the personal surety process to the tier three and tier four facilities without developing another a critical backlog. Yeah. Now our, our plan is to, uh, to um, do this incrementally, um, to do sort of a, to take a phased approach and to work with between 80 and 85 uh, companies, 80 and 85 facilities um, on a monthly basis to talk them through their options for complying with the terrorist ties vetting piece of our personnel surety risk-based uh, performance standard. Uh, we have the, uh, the uh, capability to do this. We have the capacity to do this. Uh, we anticipate uh, working through the tier three and four facilities within the next three years. Let's assume uh, that the worst case developed. I mean, we hope it, all of us hope it doesn't, and I know you'll be committed to not having this happen, but let's assume that a big backlog did, did develop. Uh, what accommodations should be made uh, to avoid jeopardizing the entire CFATS program if that backlog develops for the Tier 3 and Tier 4 yeah. facilities? Well, I, I think that in going in a phased fashion, uh, we will avoid um, the prospect of a backlog. Um, but if, if we were to find ourselves with a backlog, uh, we could we could have the flexibility to ratchet back a, a little bit. But I, I'm very confident uh, we will not uh, we will not get a backlog in the personnel surety arena, and we're going to work with facilities. Um, you know, those 80 to 85 uh, a month. We're going to be sensitive to the operational um, uh, needs of facilities, particularly where we have companies that have multiple um, CFATS covered facilities. We don't want to hit them all at the uh, at the same time with these uh, these requirements. So we have have and expect to continue to work uh, very successfully and cooperatively with facilities as we move through the personnel surety process. Okay. Uh, in an industrial accident uh, context, the EPA has uh, is required to consider worst case scenarios from a community health and welfare perspective. 
when you're looking at CFATS for terrorism purposes, uh, how does uh, the DHS evaluate the community surrounding high-risk uh, facilities like schools, hospitals, and population density? So we look at, we look at the entirety of, uh, of the surrounding population. Um, we model that um, based on potential directions of uh, prospective, uh, prospective plumes of, uh, of released uh, chemicals. We evaluate it with respect to daytime and nighttime um, populations, and that certainly includes uh, those who are uh, found in schools, uh, those folks who are in, uh, in hospitals. Okay. Thank you for your important feedback, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes a representative from Michigan. Uh, Representative, Representative Dingle for five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman Tanko, Tanko, and thank you for having this hearing um, today. And Mr. Wolf, I thank you for your work because it really is very important, and I do hope we're able to find some bipartisan common ground on this. And it is particularly fitting that we are doing this on 9-11. Uh, and I, I come from Michigan, which ha and actually my district has a number of uh, those chemical facilities or borders on them. And I suspect I'm probably one of the only people that it was 2001, but uh, earlier that year that Adafino in Riverview had the explosion and we went through an evacuation. So I uh, remember the fear in that community and it was an accident. Sure. I don't even know if you're familiar with it. So. Michigan uh, is one of the states that's got a lot of uh, chemical facilities. And we have been hit hard uh, by the PFAS contamination. So I'm gonna focus on that today. Uh, and I've, I've got questions um, about the use of these chemicals and what we're doing for to notify people in the area, and are, how quickly are we developing other replacements? I've spent a lot of time in this in the last month during the August recess talking to people, and it's clear when you have high intensity fires, uh, et cetera, that um, PFAS right now, foam, is one of the things that can deal with it the most effectively, but are there other things that are available? When the Intercontinental Terminals Company facility caught fire in Deer Park, Texas, in the March of this year, PFAS firefoatings were used to stop the blazes. When the EPA tested the nearby Galveston Bay, they found PFAS contamination at about 1,000 times higher than it's currently allowed in drinking water. And while the ITC facility is not a DH facility, it's a maritime transportation uh, security facility, it's, embl it's emblematic of the larger concerns around chemical facility safety and the use of um, triple F foam and the emerging contaminant we've been talking about on PFAS. So, Mr. Wolf, I want to, wanted to know what you've done to update your instructions to CFAP participants to limit the use of PFAS foams to fight, fire, to fight fires at covered facilities, and are there alternatives, and are we moving fast enough to develop safe and effective alternatives? Yeah. Now, so I, I appreciate that question, and I think certainly a, a significant, uh, significant concern. Um, you know, I think that is something I'm going to have to take back uh, and reach back uh, to you upon. I think that's really important. So, do you, as you're doing this, do you know if you've got a DHH has a plan to phase out firefighting foams as, as, as part of your site security plans? Um, I'm going to have to get back to you on that as well. So let me keep asking questions that I, th and I, th this is just real, because I do, I mean, I'm living, Michigan's got more contaminated PFAS sites than any state. Quite frankly, I don't think we know whether we've got more than anybody or we've tested more than any other state. So I suspect we're going to start to see this in a lot of other states. We just know about it. But when a chemical security inspector enters a facility for compliance, are they looking for or documenting how much PFAS chemicals are at the facility? So those, ins those inspectors, I appreciate the, uh, the question, are um, looking across uh, an array of risk-based performance standards and assessing the extent to which a facility has, is complying with the, uh, the security measures it has, it has um, promised to put into place within its site security plan. And those include measures related to incident, uh, incident response. So to the extent 
um, specific chemicals um, are used in, in that response, they would be looking at that. So when you get back to me, is there a way to use safer chemicals or chemicals in lower thresholds and limit the need for PFAS firefighting foams? And are you working with the Department of Defense who's contributed to this to also develop those foams? I know you gotta get back to me. But at the end of your testimony, and I've only got 25 seconds, you say DHS is focused on ways to enhance and involve the CFAS program. You also say you're taking a deep dive into efficiency and enhancements to CFAS. Does that include PFAS chemicals? Uh, it is, uh, you know, it is not something that we have, uh, you know, we have looked at, but. I'm out of time, but if you lived in Michigan and you might want the one that I lived through this bill closed, but I still have, I'm, my down rivers have lots of facilities, so we care. And so does my whole district does, but in different ways. So thank you for the work you do, but this one matters too. Thank you. The general lady yields back. The chair now recognizes uh, Representative Carter for five minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Wolf, for being here. This is extremely important, and we appreciate your participation in this. Um, I've had the opportunity during our, our August break to visit a number of the chemical manufacturers in my district, and, and I've been very impressed. All of them are, are cooperative. They get it. They understand. They, they, they want to do what's right. What they don't want is just unnecessary changes that aren't really going to increase safety, but instead just increase cost. And I noticed during your testimony that one of the things that you said was that um, since you started the program, that there's been a dramatic improvement in the pace of inspections and reviews and approval. How has DHS done this, and how have you been able to, to make this work? Yeah, so, uh, you know, we, I appreciate that question. We rolled up our sleeves. We looked at areas where we had bottlenecks in processes. Uh, we looked at areas where we... Um, felt as though we could do more to train our, uh, our workforce, and we, uh, we got to work. And I will say that a big part of, uh, of being able to do that um, was that we enjoyed, beginning in December of 2014, the stability that came along with long-term authorization of the program. Before that point, we were sort of going from fiscal year to fiscal year through the appropriations process, or worse, from continuing resolution to continuing resolution. Uh, we didn't know um, whether in the event of a, a funding hiatus, a government shutdown, whether the program would cease to exist for a, uh, for a period of time. So that was really no way to operate um, but the stability that long-term authorization has afforded has really enabled us to make those key improvements. It's my understanding that um, you, you had a GAO uh, um, audit and, and that this led you to make some changes um, in, in your efforts. And I was just in, in also in, in risk reduction metric as well as enhancing outreach to local emergency planners. Um, how have you done that? Yeah, so um, with respect to the metric, um, we've dug in and and um, built, a, um, built a methodology through which we can assess the, um, the level of security at the uh, beginning of a facility's uh, entrance into the CFATS program and the level of security increase that it, uh, it has achieved uh, to, at the point at which uh, we get to approving the facility site security plan. And on average, facilities have shown a 55% increase in security um, uh, from uh, between those two periods. With respect to outreach to local emergency planning uh, committees, that has always been a priority of ours. We have redoubled our efforts over the last, uh, last year or so uh, and have uh, personally engaged uh, upwards of 800 uh, separate local emergency planning committees um, that uh, represent the uh, highest concentration uh, counties, you know, the counties with the largest number of CFATS facilities found in them. Would you describe your relationship working with the businesses as being good? I mean, do you feel like they're cooperating, feel like uh, they're, they're receptive? Yes, I absolutely, absolutely would. You'll hear from a, a couple of our industry stakeholders on the next panel. Um, industry um, writ large has embraced this program, has worked with us to 
uh, help improve the, uh, the program over the years. We could not, uh, we could not accomplish the chemical security mission uh, without that, uh, that level of commitment. Okay, in my last uh, minute and a half, I want to ask you specifically about some things related to my district. I represent the entire coast of Georgia, including two major seaports. Tell me what you do differently, if anything, in the way of, uh, of safety in the, in the seaports, particularly when they're transferring the chemicals, if they're shipping them or if they're, they're bringing them in, importing them. Yeah, so uh, that, is, that is a good question. Uh, and we work closely with our friends in the US Coast Guard who implement something called the Maritime Transportation uh, Security Administration Program. So facilities that are on the water uh, are regulated from a security standpoint by the, uh, by the Coast Guard. But uh, sometimes there are facilities that are co-located. There may be a, uh, a CFATS covered facility that is in the midst of a, uh, of a MITSA uh, facility regulated by the uh, Coast Guard. And so we work hand in hand with the Coast Guard captain of the port uh, to harmonize our uh, activities. Uh, in those uh, areas and ensure that everything is covered. Okay, so it's the standpoint. Coast Guard's responsibility when it gets to the port. What about the transportation from the port to the end user? Uh, so uh, if, it is, uh, if it is at a fixed facility, if it is sitting at a chemical distribution facility, for, uh, for example, uh, that facility uh, will fall under, generally speaking, unless it sits on the water, um, the CFATS program, and we'll work with that facility among the risk-based performance standard, among the security measures that will be in place will be measures related to the shipping and receiving of, the, uh, of CFATS chemicals of interest. So we'll work with those facilities as they put in place those measures. We'll inspect against those measures uh, when we go out for compliance inspections. Absolutely. Thank you very much, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the uh, representative from Colorado. Representative to get for five minutes, please. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and I'm so happy you're having this hearing. We've had a number of investigative hearings uh, about the risk of chemicals over the years, and so uh, looking at this legislation, it's really important, and I'm, I'm glad to be here. Um, I, um, uh, Mr. Wolf, I, I wanted to ask you about some of the facilities that are reporting. The EPA says that my home district, I, I, I'm like many of the members here, I have an urban district with a lot of uh, facilities that manage ha hazardous material in Denver. And, and the EPA says Denver has 27 facilities that are man managing enough hazardous material to be required to complete risk management plans under the Clean Air Act. And it has 21 facilities that manage enough hazardous chemicals to be reporting under the toxic release inventory. But Department of Homeland Security staff told my staff yesterday that um, only three facilities in my district are deemed high enough risk to be subject um, to the chemical facility anti-terrorist standards that are the subject of this hearing. So I'm, I'm wondering if you can tell me what the difference is, why we would have all these facilities that have to have this other reporting, but yet only three that, that DHS has determined to be at a high enough risk. Yeah, no, I, pre I appreciate that question. So CFATS uh, is a security-focused program, and it is focused on the highest risk facilities and right, that, I know that. In, our, in our anti-terrorism security program, yeah. you know, means those facilities that, based on a number of different factors, uh, are at the highest risk of terrorist attack or exploitation. So it may relate to the types and quantities and or concentrations of the chemicals that may or uh, may be of more or less interest to potential terrorist um, adversaries. It may relate to the uh, location of the uh, facility in relation to uh, populated well, I, areas. I, you know, I, I Those know, are a variety of the factors. I, know, I mean, I know what the standards are, but I guess my question is, um, do you know, I mean, you may not know specifically about the 1st Congressional District of Colorado, but but does your agency review all of these other um, facilities that have these kinds of chemicals that have to do the reporting um, to determine whether they do meet that threshold or not? So the, uh, the sort of entry point for CFATS is the, uh, the requirement to file a top screen to initiate that risk assessment process. So you know, more than 30,000 facilities have initiated the process because they have one or more right. of our CFATS chemicals of interest at or above 
the threshold quantities or concentrations. And so, you know, we have tiered as, high, as being at high risk of terrorist attack or exploitation about 10% of those facilities. So uh, it is very conceivable that some of those other facilities are among those 30,000 facilities right, that, they have probably filed, are, that yeah. have filed top screens. But so they have been reviewed by your agency, is what you're saying? Yes, we uh, okay. likely if so, they have if they have threshold quantities of CFATS chemicals, it's likely that they have submitted so, a top So the other thing is, is the, the the DHS people wouldn't tell us which three facilities were were listed. Is there some reason for that? So uh, you know, certainly we strive to balance um, you know balance things on the information sharing um, front. Um, but I think we certainly can make that information. Yeah, I mean, because to you. because yeah. you know what I'm looking at is in in the first congressional district, which, as I say, we have a lot of chemical facilities. We have a, you know, you have to balance between um, secrecy so that so that terrorists don't find out about it. You also have to though find out uh, so the public knows what's in their neighborhood, and that's yes. why I asked the question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It is a balance. All right, so they'll let me know. Now, um, is it true that some facilities have minimized the inherent risk of their operations, for example, by reducing the storage of hazardous materials to the point where they're no longer considered high risk? Uh, it, is, it is true that thousands of facilities over the course of CFATS program's history have reduced their, uh, their holdings of CFATS chemicals of interest. And, and that would be in the public interest, I would think. We view that as a success of the program. Okay, great. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The gentleman lady yields back, and we now recognize the representative from Illinois, Representative Schakowsky, for five minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to thank the chairman for calling this hearing, and also uh, Mr. Wolf. I want to thank you for um, returning um, to talk to our committee especially on this day on 9-11 on about these critical programs. I also, I want to thank you for coming to Illinois last summer um, to present at the DHS um, Chem Security Talk um, that was held in Chicago. And at, uh, at that event, you spoke about the importance of the um, CFATS uh, program and the um, importance of taking the program on the road. And so I wanted to, to just ask you a bit about those, um, discuss those sessions. Um, first, are those uh, sessions ongoing? Is DHS uh, continuing to travel the, the country um, to bring important information, that's how we viewed it, about the, uh, the CFATS program to people where they live? Uh, absolutely, we are. So, yeah, and I appreciate the uh, the comment on the chemical security talks we held last year. Uh, one of those events in Chicago, one in Oakland, uh, as well as one in Philadelphia. Uh, this year, we held a larger form chemical security summit in uh, in New Orleans, and uh, it's great to bring the entire extended chemical security community together to share information about CFATS, to uh, discuss. Uh, sort of hot topics, uh, policy updates, those sorts of things, and certainly best practices for securing chemical facilities. So absolutely continues to be a priority. And on uh, you know less of a big splash uh, level, we continue to prioritize getting out to local emergency planning uh, committees, getting out to state level industry associations to spread the word about the, uh, about the program and ensure that companies uh, with facilities that have threshold quantities of CFATS uh, covered chemicals of interest let, know let that me, they uh, report those to us. Well, first of all, I wish you fun in New Orleans. I was just there for a conference at a ball. Yeah. Anyway. It um, is a pretty fun second, spot. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what, uh, are there any efforts, uh, when you think about stakeholders, are there any efforts to make sure that um, some of the labor unions are involved in these sessions at all? Uh, yes, we have we have a good relationship with the uh, with the labor unions. Um, you know, we certainly reach out across all stakeholder communities, and you know, we hope that they will be part of of uh, sessions such as chemical security talks. Right. Um, I think it's uh, absolutely essential that these stakeholders stakeholders have a role. Um, in ensuring the security of individual facilities and would like to ask a few questions about the experience of workers 
Um, so what requirements are currently in place to ensure that employees have a role in the development of site security plans um, at covered facilities? Yeah, so I, pre I appreciate that question, and I think employees um, now are, uh, are very much involved in the development of site security plans. I think specifically, and I think this is appropriate, employees who have sort of security-related expertise or roles um, in uh, in the security process. Uh, the current, um, you know, the current state of play. Uh, is that uh, there's a requirement uh, that facilities, to the extent, greatest extent practicable, um, involve uh, employees in the development of site security plans, employees with that relevant security-focused expertise, and that would include uh, employees uh, at uh, facilities that are covered by um, bargaining units. I think it's so important because it can differ from facility to facility and the workers really know what is going on. Do you know, if, are the workers allowed to pick their own representative when uh, opportunities arise for worker input? Uh, I believe the situation is that the, you know, the facility security officer uh, determines um, which employees uh, are best uh, positioned to provide meaningful input to the development of a site security plan. Now this may sound like a silly question. Do all employees at uh, CFAT uh, facilities know they work at a CFAT facility? <laughs> so, um, you know, again, that, that is kind of where we get to the balance, striking the appropriate balance um, between sharing information uh, with those who have a need to know it and you know keeping sensitive information from those who might not have a need to know so uh, at a cfats covered facility all employees uh, will be part of uh, mandated uh, um, training and exercise programs so that they're aware of how to uh, how to deal with security at and who to go to right oh yeah, yeah okay yeah. great thanks my time is up i appreciate you very much uh, thank you so much General Lady yields back. <coughs> Excuse me. The chair now recognizes the representative from New York, Representative Clark, for five minutes, please. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank our ranking member Shimkus for convening this important hearing on how we can protect our workers and communities from the risks associated with hazardous chemical facilities. As a member of Congress who sits on both the Energy and Commerce and Homeland Security Committees, this legislation is particularly important to me. Adding further significance is the fact that today is also the 18th anniversary of one of the most tragic days in our nation's past, a day that me and my fellow New Yorkers still hold fresh in our memories. Chemical facilities throughout our nation, which serve a range of important functions, also pose many unique risks to our communities. And it is our duty to, in Congress to ensure that the proper protections are in place to keep our constituents safe. While a major focus of the CFATS program is to safeguard chemical facilities against acts of terrorism, it is also imperative that we consider the multiple risks that the climate crisis presents to these facilities, their workers, and surrounding communities. Many CFATS facilities are situated in areas that are highly vulnerable to natural disasters. This is especially concerning when you consider the fact that climate change is already increasing the, increasing the frequency and severity of extreme weather events, including major storms and floods. Further concerning, although not so surprising, is the fact that low-income communities and communities of color are disproportionately located near these facilities and consequently bear a greater risk of harm from potential disasters. Therefore, as we seek to better safeguard CFATS facilities from all risks, climate and otherwise, it is also important that we recognize this reality and ensure the vulnerable communities who are most impacted by these risks are also present at the table so that they can have a meaningful say in protecting their own futures. Mr. Wolf, thank you for being here today to offer testimony on this matter. According to the EPA's toxic release inventory, there are currently 408 chemical facilities in and around Brooklyn, New York, that handle toxic chemicals. And you don't need to look too closely into a map or at a map to realize that many of these facilities are located within or adjacent to high-risk flood areas. 
So can you please describe some of the major risks that CFAT's facilities and their surrounding communities face due to flooding and severe storms? And I appreciate I appreciate the question. I appreciate the support for uh, for the CFATS um, program. Of course, CFATS uh, is an anti-terrorism program focused on uh, security. Um, but you know, weather events uh, certainly pose a threat to uh, to all manner of facilities uh, as well. Uh, and although I think it's important that we retain within the CFATS program our laser focus on uh, on anti-terrorism. Uh, and on, uh, on enhancing security at facilities that are at high risk of terrorist attack or exploitation. The measures that uh, facilities put into place, um, redundant, uh, you know, redundant systems, emergency power to, uh, to enhance their security can have additional benefits in the, uh, the weather-related I think it was the Houston well. storm that we saw a horrible um, incident with the chemical facility. Um, has, have we learned anything um, from that event? Yeah, so, uh, you know, there, what we, uh, we do engage um, in the event of a, uh, of a weather, uh, weather scenario with our CFATS covered facilities. Uh, we are in frequent uh, and constant communication with those facilities to, you know, assess their status. Uh, to talk about whether they have any unmet needs. And I will say that, uh, you know, those uh, facilities are very, certainly very security aware, certainly very risk aware. Uh, and actually, the, uh, the recent uh, hurricane scenario, Hurricane Dorian, uh, we were in contact with one of our facilities in Florida uh, that determined to, to make a risk-informed decision to move a rail car of, uh, of potentially uh, toxic release chemicals off of an island and to an inland uh, location. Well, let me ask, do you work with FEMA and EPA to coordinate your programs that deal with chemical facility management? And given the administration's proposed rollbacks to EPA's risk management program, do you believe that the CFATS program can and should incorporate measures to enable more first responder community and worker engagement that will help the facilities better prepare for and protect against natural disaster threats or chemical incidents. Yeah, so I think we continue to prioritize within uh, within the CFATS program today uh, that outreach and engagement with the first responder communities, having been uh, in person, um, not myself, but our team, to over 800 local emergency planning committees over the uh, course of the uh, of the past year. So that certainly continues to be a uh, to be a priority, and uh, you know certainly uh, remain in contact uh, and uh, and coordination with uh, our counterparts at, uh, at EPA and FEMA. Very well. Thank you very much for your response today. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The general lady yields back. That concludes our first panel. I would like to thank Mr. Wolf for joining us today. Um, Mr. Wolf, I ask that you respond promptly to any questions for the record that you receive from our members following this hearing. And at this time, I ask that staff prepare the witness table such that we may uh, begin our second panel shortly.
Okay. okay, we will resume with the second panel now uh, to share their thoughts. Um, now hear from four witnesses. Uh, we'll start with my left uh, with Mr. Uh, John Paul Smith, legislative representative for United Steelworkers. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, next to him, we have Ms. Michelle Roberts, National Co-Coordinator of the Environmental Justice Health Alliance. Thank you, Ms. Roberts. And next to Ms. Roberts, we have Mr. Scott Welchel, Chief Security Office and Global Director of Emergency Services and Security for Dow Chemical Company on behalf of the American Chemistry Council. Thank you, Mr. Welchel. And finally, Mr. Matthew Fridley, Corporate Manager of Safety, Health, and Security Brentag North America, Inc., on behalf of National Association of Chemical Distributors. We want to thank our witnesses for joining us today. We look forward to your testimony. At this time, the chair will now recognize each witness to um, present five minutes' worth of opening statements. Before we begin, begin, I will like to explain the lighting system. In front of you is a series of lights. The light will initially be green at the start of your opening statement. The light will turn yellow when you have one minute remaining. Please begin to wrap up your testimony at that point, and the light will turn red when your time has expired. So, um, Mr. Smith, you uh, may start. You have five minutes, please. Chairman Tonko, Ranking Member Shimkus, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm here on behalf of the United Steelworkers International Union. Our union is the largest industrial union in North America and represents the majority of unionized workers in the chemical industry. Before coming to Washington, I worked in this sector for a little more than 10 years, and then as a police officer for four, where I received some basic homeland security training. In the very southern tip of Illinois, near the confluence of the Ohio and Mississippi rivers, sits a uranium conversion facility where I was fortunate to earn from my family and serve the local union in several capacities, including chairing the Health and Safety Committee. This facility, currently idled, processes uranium, later used in nuclear fuel. The facility housed large quantities of very dangerous chemicals, including hydrofluoric acid, sulfuric acid, liquid hydrogen, and potassium hydroxide. A release at the facility would have obvious catastrophic consequences. Worst case scenario models accounted for an affected radius that included several small towns and cities. The facility is not covered by CFATS because it is regulated in part by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. But the NRC does not regulate the areas of the plant where the vast majority of these chemicals are stored. Post 9-11, the NRC did issue a site security order and included the chemical storage in the restricted area of the plant, meaning everything inside the fence line. The security order, however, did not require employee involvement, so the people most familiar working with the chemicals did not participate in the site security plan. Most of the people I worked with had never heard of CFATS. Our union makes an effort to educate our members, provides training in addition to what they receive from employers, and has an annual health, safety, and environment conference that convenes as we speak. Even with additional training and education, we have concerns that the CFATS program is widely unknown to our members and even more so to workers at non-organized facilities that do not have the benefit of the additional resources the union provides. We have tried to address this issue with the department, but meaningful progress has not been made. This is one issue that can be addressed by Congress by requiring as an initial step a worksite poster at CFATS facilities and additional worker participation. I know from my experience that every day our members manufacture and handle the most toxic and dangerous chemicals in the world. The knowledge and experience they have with these chemicals are invaluable. We know, as much or more than anyone, the hazards associated with these substances and the potential for damage to critical infrastructure, along with injury and loss of lives. It is crucial that the CFATs include language requiring worker involvement in the site security plan and that workers are able to choose the person to best represent them. That representative should participate throughout all phases of security planning implementation and inspections. Our members are tasked with dealing with minor accidental chemical releases, fires and explosions on a more regular basis than most realize and with large scale events like the explosion and fire that happened on June 21st of this year near our HF unit at the Philadelphia Energy Solutions Refinery in South Philadelphia where their quick skilled actions save the community from disaster. Whether from unintentional incidents or intentional terroristic threats, our members know the security of the facilities they work in is of grave importance. Many of the refineries like PES, where our members work and live, that fall under the jurisdiction of the Marine Transportation Security Act are exempted from the CFATS program. 
we ask for the removal of that exemption and oppose any new exemptions. We are concerned about legislative proposals that would exempt large categories of facilities and chemicals, such as explosives and mixtures. Our union supports stronger language for whistleblower protections with a provision for remedy in the bill reauthorization. Notifying workers they are at a CFETS facility and have whistleblower protections should be a priority. Having a remedy process makes workers more comfortable reporting violations. The legislation should also encourage facilities to employ industry practices that reduce risk and eliminate hazards. There are facilities that have instituted controls that have inherently reduced risk, and those lessons should be shared for implementation across the industry. Reducing or eliminating hazards has a far greater effect on protecting workers and communities and target reduction than adding fences, cameras, and guards. It is critical that relevant information be shared with local first responders, local officials, and unions. Workers and the public are important stakeholders in preventing and responding to incidents. Our union opposes any legislation that takes the industry down a path of self-regulation. Congress has the opportunity to strengthen the security of our country's chemical facilities and make workers in our community safer by closing some of the gaps of the CFETS program and making sure the working people of these facilities have a voice that is heard. Once again, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you so much, Mr. Smith. And uh, next we'll hear from Ms. Roberts. You have five minutes, please. Ms. Roberts, can you just, yeah. Sorry, my mic was not on. Can you hear me now? Thank, Thank you. you very much for having the opportunity to present before you today. Um, it is very important because today I stand for the many communities that many people don't see, those who live in the shadows of these facilities. My name is Michelle Roberts. I'm the National Co-Coordinator of the Environmental Justice Health Alliance for Chemical Policy Reform, EJHA, is who we refer ourselves to be. I'm equally um, an environmental scientist. EJHA is a national collective of grassroots groups that throughout the country working to achieve environmental and economic justice. As, a recent in, at, as recent industrial disasters in Wisconsin, as you heard, Texas and others, Pennsylvania, illustrate a major industrial chemical release fire or explosion can injure workers, endanger communities, and cause the abrupt closure of important industrial facilities. While those specific incidents were not terrorism related, they show the serious vulnerability of facilities located in communities around the country. CFATS is a critical program to defend against these incidents. Reauthorizing CFATS represents an important opportunity to strengthen its effect effectiveness. The existing statute may, must be improved in several areas. To name a few examples, it should include water treatment and maritime facilities, include clear protections against cybersecurity threats, and require that the Department of Homeland Security verify statements submitted by facilities that claim to no longer fall within the jurisdiction of CFATS. In addition to those points, I refer you to a letter um, that we submitted to the committee from a Coalition of Health Worker Environmental Justice and Ally Organizations by Blue Green Alliance on August 23rd, 2019. More broadly, environmental justice communities like those affiliated with EJHA have issues with the following areas of the current insufficient CFATS program. Frankly, the entire CFATS program is secretive and confusing. Even experienced advocates are sometimes unsure about aspects of CFATS because it's impossible to know for sure what facilities are even required to participate in CFATS, it's impossible for community members or advocates to fully understand the level of danger, planning, preparedness, or the lack thereof, et cetera, in their neighborhoods. The best way to guess that a facility might be a CFATS facility is if it's an RMP, Risk Management Program Facility, but that's not a sure thing. The emergence of new technologies and cybersecurity threats coupled with this administration's attacks on the other foundational policies and programs that protect workers and communities from catastrophic events and hazardous facilities means that a really strong and important CFATS bill and program are more important now than ever. The CFATS program is absolutely critical to protect the financial uh, interests of these facilities as well as the health and safety of their workers and the surrounding communities, particularly in the light of the total failure of the EPA's risk management program to do so. 
Further, we need CFAT's program to reduce and eliminate potential terrorists. We need best practices, information, and lessons learned um, should be shared and used to guide the standards setting for other similar facilities. We need CFAT's program should account for overburdened communities and vulnerable populations. The CFAT's program and site planning decisions absolutely must be uh, more inclusive of and transparent to workers at CFAT's facilities. EJHA strongly supported and advocated for the 2017 modest, most deeply important improvements to the RMP rule. While the improvements didn't go far enough to be fully protective, they added critical elements that EPA is now trying to roll back. Though not the subject of this particular hearing, we need each of the members of this committee to join us in strongly calling for EPA to fully implement the 2017 improvements of the risk management program and additionally strengthen the CFATS program for those folks who I said languish in the shadows, the ones you don't see until an, an, an ex explosion occurs. And then unfortunately, we are seeing traumatized folks who, by the way, are living in trauma daily, not knowing who is actually thinking about them should there be explosion. Thank you very much. We need a more protective uh, of bill for our people and for workers. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Ms. Robertson. Now we'll hear from Mr. Welchel for five minutes, please, and welcome. Good afternoon, Chairman Tonko, Ranking Member Shimkus, and distinguished members of the committee. My name is Scott Welchel. I am Chief Security Officer and Global Director of Emergency Services and Security for Dow, a material science company headquartered in Midland, Michigan. In addition to my role at Dow, I am currently Vice Chair of the Chemical Sector Coordinating Council. Prior to joining Dow, I had the privilege of serving as Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness Director for St. Charles Parish, Louisiana, a community with a nuclear power facility and over 20 other industrial sites. In St. Charles, industry and government work together in an all hazards and whole community approach to emergency management. While in this role, I was honored to be elected by my peers to serve as president of the Louisiana Emergency Preparedness Association. I'm also a member of the Security Committee of the American Chemistry Council, on whose behalf I am testifying today. And I hope to bring both the private and public sector perspectives to the discussion. I wanna thank you for allowing me to participate in this important, important hearing, especially on this solemn occasion of 9-11, and am pleased to provide important input on the CFATS program. Since its inception, CFATS has made many programmatic improvements. These include improved site security inspectors and inspections, risk assessment processes, the security plan authorization process, and its collaboration with the regulated community and others. CFAT's inspectors' levels of expertise has vastly improved, and the program demonstrates broad consistency across regions in the application of that expertise. CFATS has an effective model of centralized management and decentralized execution, which allows for headquarters and the compliance branch to resolve any confusion stemming from the variability in the interpretation of the CFAS performance standards. This consistency has brought trust. CFATS and the regulated community have not benefited from the uncertainty stemming from short-term reauthorization. Longer authorization periods provide important stability for covered facilities to effectively plan for security investments, as well as enabling DHS to more efficiently and effectively manage their program. Given this, the ACC and its member companies see the value and the need for periodic congressional oversight and would not support permanent reauthorization. It has been said that failures in security happen at the seams, the seams of people, processes, and policy. Given that security risk is a function of threat vulnerability, and consequence. It takes both industry and government and others to work together on each of the factors in this equation. Therefore, it is imperative that DHS remains as transparent as possible regarding the specific factors driving the risk and resulting risk tier levels at facilities. CFAT should embrace the post 9-11 philosophy 
of need to know, but responsibility to share. Having spent over 20 years in the intelligence community, I fully understand both sides of this equation and recognize the challenges inherent in sharing information that is sensitive or classified. In that same spirit, industry must share all relevant information needed for comprehensive emergency planning with local emergency managers and response agencies. Not only is this already addressed in the CFAT's risk-based performance standards, it is best covered, covered by safety regulations overseen by the EPA and OSHA. But even with those drivers, information sharing is only one step in the cycle. It is incumbent not only on industry to share, but for emergency management officials to drive integrated planning, coupled with implementation of comprehensive and inclusive exercise and, tra and training strategies to complement the hazard awareness that comes with that information sharing. In St. Charles Parish, both government and industry adhere to a set of supporting, mutually supporting obligations. As we sit here today, local and state emergency planners and other agencies receive chemical inventory data. This data in many states is available in digital form and can be immediately uploaded by those state and local agencies into Cameo, our computer-aided management of emergency operations, to facilitate enhanced emergency planning efforts. The CFATS program has made our industry, our communities, and our country more secure. CFATS will grow stronger by adopting the improvements outlined in the written testimony provided and through continued engagement of this committee to ensure the CFATS program stays on track. The long-term security of our nation is a goal and a commitment that we all share. On behalf of both the American Chemistry Council and Dow, I appreciate this opportunity to present our views on this important issue. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Welchel. And finally, we'll hear from Mr. Fridley. Welcome and are recognized for five minutes, please. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, Chairman Taco, Ranking Member Shimkus, and distinguished members of the committee. My name is Matthew Fridley, and I am the Safety, Health, and Security Manager for Brentech North America, a chemical distribution company headquartered in Reading, Pennsylvania. In addition to my role at Brentech North America, I'm currently the chair of the Chemical Sector Coordinating Council. The Coordinating Council has a strong working uh, partnership in both the private and public sectors to develop industry practices to build culture in safety and security. I am also the Vice Chair of the Regulatory Affairs and Security Committee for the National Association of Chemical Distributors, on whose behalf I am testifying today. I thank you for allowing me to participate in this important hearing today, and I'm pleased to provide input on the Chemical Facility Anti-Terrorism Standard. Rentag is currently the largest chemical distributor globally and the second largest chemical distributor in the United States. Rentag North America operates over 180 facilities, employs over 5,100 people. Rentag is an active member of the NACD for over 35 years. We have been uh, protect, participating in, in NACD's responsible distribution program since its inception in 1991. This comprehensive program addresses environmental, health, safety, and security risks. Member companies are third party verified to ensure quality and performance. While security has always been an inherent element of the responsible distribution, after the 9-11 terrorist attacks, NACD added specific security elements to the program and the association continues to enhance these requirements. In 2013, NACD added a specific security code to responsible distribution that consolidated many prior requirements and enhanced others. These requirements apply to all NACD members, including those who do not have facilities subject to the CFATS regulation. NACD and Brentag support a long-term reauthorization of the CFATS. I believe the CFATS program has made the chemical industry in our nation much more secure. From the time of the program's establishment in 2007, the an industry has invested significant capital and training resources towards enhanced security measures at our facilities. In fact, Brentag, as one of the most regulated companies under CFATS, knows the importance of this program better than most. While these resources did not necessarily assist us in growing business, they were nonetheless important to ensure the security of our company, our employees, and community. DHS has generally taken a non-adversarial and reasonable approach in implementing the CFATS regulation. DHS have made significant improvements in a program following the program's 2014 reauthorization. Changes in leadership of the CFAS program help establish a commitment to work with the regulated chemical industries, including the Chemical Sector Coordinating Council. Another reason for the success of the CFAS program is, in fact, that DHS has taken the time to truly understand the diversity of the chemical industry and work with regulated community on security measures. 
The clear objective of CFAT's program is to help facilities be more secure. While not taking a punitive approach, DHS has ex excelled in outreach in three key ways. They have published numerous fact sheets and lessons learned documents, interacting with facility owners and operators during the chemical sector security summits and other industry meetings, and always making inspectors and headquarter personnel available to walk and talk through issues or questions. The program's 2014 reauthorization, which for the first time provided CFATS a multi-year reauthorization, further enhanced security efforts by providing regulatory certainty to both industry and DHS. This stability allowed DHS to increase, increase efficiencies in the program while streamlining the information submission process for regulated facilities. It is my hope that Congress can pass a long-term reauthorization of CFAS program. I believe the CFAS program is strong and requires minimal change. One priority I can recommend is to require that any changes to the Appendix A chemicals of interest list remain subject to rulemaking. Changes to the COI list could have a major impact on my business operation and security investments. Changes may be needed upon discovery of a new threat information, but it is important for regulated communities like mine to be able to provide information to DHS and explain the impacts on any proposed changes. I also support the creation of the program where DHS would recognize companies that meet certain criteria, such as participation in a program like responsible distribution. By acknowledging responsible distributors, DHS would then be able to prioritize resources for the non-compliant outliers that may pose a greater security risk. CFAS is recognized globally as a model chemical security framework worldwide, and DHS frequently responds to re requests to work with other governments as they seek to build cultures on chemical security similar to the United States. As the only federal program focused solely on facility site security with COIs, this must remain a CFAS program's only purpose. On June 19th, the House Homeland Security Committee approved H.R. 3256, which will now be considered by this committee. While NACD applauds Congress' commitment to reauthorizing the CFAS program, we are concerned that provisions in H.R. 3256 would jeopardize the integrity of the program. Congress must ensure the CFAS reauthorization legislation only strengthens, not weakens, facility site security. On behalf of the NACD and BRIDTEG, I appreciate this opportunity to present our views on this important issue, and I look forward to answering your questions. Mr. Fridley, thank you. Thank you to our entire panel. We have now concluded opening statements with our second panel, and we now move to member questions, and I'll start by recognizing myself for five minutes. So, Mr. Fridley and Mr. Welchel, it seems that good work is being done by industry in terms of seeking to reduce risks. And I fully understand that these types of risk reduction measures might not be possible at every site. But generally, do you think these types of actions to minimize, substitute, moderate, or simplify hazardous processes are worthy of exploring when a facility is considering how to address security at those individual sites? Well, we're a chemical distribution company, so our inventory and our, um, what we have on site is, is directly affected by our customers. So we are working with some of our customers on explaining this process. We actually have a Know Your Customer program through the Responsible Distribution Program that we go out and we work with those customers for they understand that the chemicals that they may be ordering may be subjected to CFATS regulation. In turn, we'll work with them to maybe, is there an alternative to their process? If there is, then that would directly affect my inventory so I wouldn't have to carry as much uh, inventory that I'd have at my site. Mr. Welchel? Yes, sir. Um, appreciate the question. And I remember finally being part of a chemical, um, a CFATS reauthorization, uh, <coughs> excuse me, a CFATS top screen uh, meeting where we were assessing the uh, the um, facility for whether it should be screened in or out of the um, of the program, and it was during the discussion with the CFATS inspector that they put forth the opportunity to visit risk reduction in the way of changing either the inventory or the uh, concentration or other variables within the the um, COI, and it was very welcomed by the, uh, the the business and the chemistry was changed and we were able to make those changes to our chemical processes we immediately started to replicate that potential to other sites. And, and I'm pleased to say we did so at multiple sites. Thank you. And do you believe there could be greater guidance or encouragement from the department to assess these types of risks, reduction measures as part of the broader security plan? I actually believe that the right balance has been struck. So the conversation was initiated initially by CFATS inspectors, 
but it took our knowledge of chemistry and our ability to look at our processes to carry it the rest of the way. So I believe the CFATS program is doing the right thing in terms of initiating the action, and then industry then steps in to meet the rest of the way for, uh, for developing how we do chemical production in a safer way. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Fridley, you would concur or? Yeah, I would absolutely concur with, with uh, Scott's answer to that. And, and the biggest thing is, to his point, it's a shared responsibility. You know, we have responsibility as well to educate our customers. And again, it goes back to you know, your customer program, which is a, a staple in, in our industry. Okay, thank you. Ms. Roberts and Mr. Smith, I want to get your thoughts on this because to my mind, working to reduce risks from the outset is likely one of the most important ways to provide meaningful protection for workers and frontline communities. Um, can you give us some perspective on what it means to reduce risk for the people you are here to represent? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I can give one example, at least the facility I worked at. Uh, they changed one of the processes from using uh, anhydrous ammonia uh, to aqueous ammonia, inherently reducing the risk of release of anhydrous ammonia, uh, I'm sorry, completely eliminated it from the facility. Uh, so it, it removed that target uh, to a much safer technology and also protected the workers at the, at the site. Thank you, and Ms. Roberts? Yes, and just in a, um, also it's important to understand that many of the communities who live fence line to these facilities are in housing structures that are not conducive to even sheltering in place if that be the case. So it is extremely important for to minimize that of the reduction of risk to communities by as, as you heard, um, minimizing the amount of chemical stored, the, the, the hazard of the chemical that's stored, if indeed there can be a safer substitution that is that can be utilized. In addition to that, I know that, as we say, we're, we're not speaking about the, the climate crisis, but even that in and of itself, impacts all of that. So it is extremely important to look at all of the negative externalities that impact these communities and workers. Thank you. And what barriers might prevent these types of measures from being implemented? Is there a basis toward risk management over uh, reduction? Uh, from my experience, the, the biggest barrier for a lot of companies is cost. Uh, it can be costly to change a process to make it safer. Um, so. I think encouragement from the department to uh, employ practices at these facilities is helpful. Okay. Ms. Roberts? I do agree with that, and we are equally experiencing that with cost factor and now movement of industries. Um, we recently learned that there are industries leaving the uh, Gulf Coast because of the high rates of, uh, that are attributed to that of the hurricanes, whether it's insurance or replacement. And so some of these industries are now seeking to move into what we're calling Chemical Valley in West Virginia and thereby placing additional burden on the communities in West Virginia. And so it is creating quite the conundrum for us at this moment. I thank you. Um, the chair now recognizes Mr. Shimkus, the uh, subcommittee ranking member, for five minutes to ask questions, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think we've got some, some agreement that uh, long-term reauthorization of CFAS is, is important. I would agree. Would everyone agree with that? Um, and I, I, if you've heard the first panel and then this panel, we, we still struggle with the, the difficulty between uh, information available versus security of that information, getting in it to the, pe the proper, the right people, because um, in World War II, is loose lips sink ships, and I think there's that concern. So it's how do you balance that for information versus basic security? Um, and then I think you hear from our side uh, a concern about ensuring that we don't duplicate other agencies who are supposed to be doing their, their work, whether they're not doing, you know, if the EPA, if there's, a, if there's a concern that the EPA is not doing risk management aspects, then we ought to kick EPA in the rear end to do risk management, not give to a security agency that responsibility. So, I, but I think we're close. I mean, I, I actually, 
uh, this, these have been good hearings. Let me go to Mr. Welchel first, um, you know, because in, in addressing the, this brief opening statement that I did here on this round of questioning, we've always had this debate on the personal surety programs, uh, risk tiering processes, uh, and that there is a concern that uh, information is not being shared. I think well, Mr. Smith kind of re uh, recognized that. Um, do you believe DHS needs to make changes to improve uh, a regulated facility's awareness of the risk factors? I believe in a couple of areas there's work to do. So I, I do believe that CFAT's program has st struck the right balance in looking at need to know and, and uh, persons that are covered under that need to know provision. Um, uh, chemical terrorism vulnerability information or CVI is an appropriate um, component of the program. But to your point on tiering, um, as an example, uh, what moves a facility from one tier to another once we put the information into uh, CFAT's black box, for lack of a better term? Um, that's still a little bit unknown, right? Um, another thing that I think they can do more on information sharing um, is how, how do we, uh, whenever we submit our personal identifying information for 12.4, um, for our personnel surety, where does it go? How long does it sit there prior to actually getting uh, bounced off the TSDB or terrorism screening database? What does that process look like? Um, that's important for us to know because if we're going to limit certain actions at the facility as a result of not having those people submitted or not having um, a feedback from the TSDB, then our operations might languish while we're waiting for those processes to have an effect. Um, and if there is a hit on the TSDB, will we be made aware of that? Will we be the partner at the table to help work through that risk um, potential? Great, thank you. Mr. Fidley, I'm going to lump my two questions together in, in the sake of time. Um, you are the head of the Chemical Sector Coordinating Council. Can you kind of briefly explain what does that mean? And then the follow-up would be, how do you differentiate between what is safety and what is security? Because uh, that's been part of our debate today. All right. Well, first, uh, Congressman Shipkiss, I want to take a second and thank you for your 24 years of uh, service to the great people of Illinois. Uh, as a constituent and that lives in your district, uh, you will be greatly missed. Thank you. And uh, wish you well. Thank you. Um, so to, to briefly kind of, I pulled out the, uh, the actual mission statement for the uh, sector council, and if you let, allow me, I'll read it to you. Uh, the mission of the council is to advance the physical, cyber, security, emergency preparedness in the national security sector infrastructure. The mission will be accomplished through voluntary actions to the infrastructure owners and operators represented in the council set forth in the presidential policy directive PPD 21 and related authorities. Um, so the chemical sector uh, coordinating council represents about 15 um, associations that are voluntarily there to work with and through uh, in collaboration uh, with DHS, Coast Guard, and, and the others. Um, and we're doing this right now as the chemical sector that represents uh, about 25% of the GDP. Um, so we're, we're a massive uh, undertaking. Uh, but we are working across cross sectors. Um, we're starting to do this even more, especially through the National Critical Work Group. Uh, to talk about some of these issues and interdependencies um, during natural disasters. Okay, safety versus security, so we'll right, get that fantastic. in. All right, sorry about that, sir. So safety versus security, safety is OSHA, security is DHS. Um, it's very two clear lines. Um, they're very much segmented between the two, and I, I don't want to confuse the two and lump them together. My time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the representative from Delaware. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Rochester. And again, thank you to the panel. Um, I wanted to just follow up on uh, Mr. Shimkus's uh, line of questioning. Uh, first of all, I, I, I can hear from the panel and also from Mr. Wolf that there is agreement that the CFAP program needs to continue, needs to continue long term, and that, again, this is the, the perfect day to be having this hearing. Um, my, I still am struggling with this conversation about the balance between need to know, um, security, risk, and meaningful engagement. Uh, so I want to flip the table a little bit. And um, because as Mr. Smith was talking, it was interesting, um, Ms. Schakowsky asked in the last panel, asked Mr. Wolf about employees and do employees know that they are working for you know, a company? And I, I understood you to say that um, 
it's for some employees it's widely unknown and that more training and things need to be done. Um, and then as I heard Ms. Roberts talk about uh, the fact that it's sometimes confusing, even people who are experts don't feel like they have the information they need. But then I also heard uh, Mr. Welchel talk about the fact that there has been that right balance struck. So it appears to me there's sort of like government and industry is good. There's, it's golden, I haven't heard disagreement. But in terms of employees in the community, I don't hear that same, same thing. So can Mr. Welchel and Mr. Fridley talk about what you think the community and employees do need to know and they're not knowing now, currently, and if you two could talk about um, what you think we, we, we don't need to know. We need to stay away from that for, for whatever reason. Do you, you get where I'm going? I know you know what you need to know, and I know, so can we start with um, Mr., and we gotta make it quick, because yep. I only have two minutes and 59 seconds. Yep, absolutely. Um, great question, and uh, what we do in our industry, and at least in our, our, our uh, facilities, is everybody is, is trained. Everybody is aware. Uh, there's not a person there that is employed at our facilities that are not made aware, and, are, and we select certain ones to be able to participate in the development of if they have the knowledge and the, you know, the, the expertise to be able to assist us in those programs. As far as the community, we are all members of LEPCs. We work with uh, various agencies. We bring in those agencies. We do drills together. Uh, we review. But are there things that they should be know that they should know and they don't know right now? In my opinion, not in my experience. Okay, in your opinion, not in your experience. Okay, Mr. Welch. Yeah, what I'll add to that is, uh, I believe there's a responsibility on the part of a local emergency management officials to bridge that gap, right? So they're getting a lot of information relative to the safety risk um, and then target information about the, any terrorism risk that might be related to chemical facilities in their district or their domain. So let me stop you right there, because I, I get where you're going, because I come from a government background. So it is, people are elected, people are appointed, um, but sometimes the community, or even in a company, they don't get access to the information. It just doesn't get to them. So I'm just curious if you think there are things that people need to know on a basic level that they're not getting information. At the risk of underscoring Mr. Fridley's point, General security awareness is a, is a cornerstone of a good security program. So you want to broadly put that security awareness out into the community and to employees. So the see something, say something doesn't just go out to the citizens of the U.S. We then target that message to our employees um, and to the extent necessary to the, uh, to the citizens out um, in the community as well through the emergency management program. And I only have a minute left, but can I ask Ms. Roberts? Yes, it is a challenge for us um, because on the local emergency planning commission, commissions, those are great commissions, but oftentimes there's one community representative on that commission. And there are many communities that could be surrounding or, or within certain facilities. One of the things that we did with the Environmental Justice Health Alliance in partnership with other uh, entities, we produced a report, Who's in Danger, Race, Poverty, and Chemical Disasters. And equally, we re uh, produced another report, Life at the Fence Line. And we did so with some of our scientific and other partners because of the fact that the communities needed to have information that they didn't have, have access to. Thank you. So and that's part of the challenge. Seven seconds. Mr. Smith. I, I can only speak on behalf of workers uh, to this effect, and workers who have went through the security process to be cleared to work in these facilities, it's my belief there's very little they should not know, uh, but I can tell you there is a huge gap in what they should know and what they don't know. Gotcha, thank you. I yield. The uh, general lady yields back. The chair now recognizes the uh, representative from Illinois, Representative Schakowsky, for five minutes, please. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have looked at the um, testimony, I want you to know, though I wasn't, uh, wasn't here in the room, and have a, uh, a number of questions that I wanted to ask. Um, so well, let me just start with, uh, with this one. Hold on. Um, I wanted to ask Ms. Roberts, in your testimony, 
You um, mentioned that um, uh, water treatment and uh, uh, and you you asked here I'll read it. The um, existing statute must um, improve in several areas. To name a few specific examples, it should include water treatment and marine facilities and on. So what I wanted you, what I wanted to ask you is if you could um, expand on what you think about the way that water ought to be considered when the investigators go out and look at the plants. Well, with respect to water treatment facilities, they actually carry, um, they include um, chlorine and other chemicals on site. And so that is the reason why we are asking that those facilities be equally included in the CFATS program. Um, oftentimes, yet again, in environmental justice communities, especially um, where they're, again, it's uh, hot, the, the disparity is uh, uh, race than income. Many of those communities are home to high risk facilities as well as water treatment facilities. And so therefore there is cumulative impacts of high risk chemicals that are in these areas. In addition to that, the maritime facilities, as you heard uh, Representative Dingle earlier speaking to the PFOA issue, and these are also challenges that our communities are confronted with. Thank you. I do feel as if um, in general, um, the, the communities, which you call, I think, people in the shadows, um, are getting the kind of um, stakeholder uh, attention that should be given when it comes to these plants and the information that you need. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, no. Um, they, if, if the community is involved in uh, what do they call it, the CAP program, the Citizen Advisory Program. They're at the behest of the industry and the industry sharing the information that the industry wishes to share. Um, if they are on a local emergency planning commission, as I said, um, equally as much, um, the community, there's one representative typically on that committee. When communities are seeking to try to find and get more information at times, sometimes they are confronted by homeland security and utilize homeland security laws um, against them as they are seeking to try to get more information on what is being um, stored in and around um, the facilities that are fence line to their communities. They are not seeking to terrorize the community, uh, these industries. They are seeking information so that they can also equally better protect themselves because many of these communities do indeed have high rates of health challenges. And again, the infrastructure around their, um, their uh, communities, such as the roads, the housing structures, and what have you, are not conducive oftentimes to the amount of pollution that they are um, being. Uh, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna interrupt you just for a second because I also wanted to um, deal with the issue of workers. The last question that I asked of um, Homeland Security was the question about um, do workers even know that they are working at a CFAT facility? And the answer was, well, they get training. But um, do you feel, just as communities don't necessarily have the, all the information, do workers, are, are you considered as stakeholders sufficiently? Yes, ma'am, in my opinion, uh, we train every person, uh, we educate every person that works at our facility that what we have, our security measures, you know, what we want, what we expect, if uh, they see something suspicious, they get a phone call, suspicious order, anything of that nature. So we're educating uh, those workforces to be able to be, you know, to report that properly to get that to the right agencies. Okay, thank you. Um, I have 10 seconds. Does steel workers want to respond at all to that? Thank you, Ms. Chikowsky. I can tell you, in our experience, most of our members do not know that they work at a CFAS facility until after an issue with the program arises. And just as a very quick example, uh, and I can follow up with specifics, 
Recently, there was a Hill staff a visit to a CFATS covered facility, and on their uh, visit, the local union president was unaware of the program or that the uh, facility was covered by the program. And that's a problem, right? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I yield back. The general lady yields back. The chair now recognizes the uh, representative from Florida who just got back, uh, Representative Soto, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you all for coming today. Uh, we had Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary Wolf in before, and we're talking about some of the lessons from 9-11 and the terrorist attacks. Uh, obviously, this is the 18th remembrance of that, and uh, that we formed the Department of Homeland Security to be sort of the coordinator of all these other agencies. So the big question that we ended up talking about was how so many first responders and other workers worked at ground zero and weren't told that the air was poisonous. Obviously, we had to create the 9-11 uh, fund afterwards and just amended it to help out. I represent an area with a lot of NYPD retirees uh, who've worked uh, and were there at the time, including some of my current staff. So a big issue for me and for everyone on the panel, and it'd be great to hear from each of you, what role should the Department of Homeland Security play in making sure, uh, as in subsection F of this legislation, that we're sharing more info with state and local emergency officials? And uh, let's start with, uh, well, we'll go down the list from starting with you, Mr. Friedley, and, and continue onward. Hey, uh, thank you for the question, and uh, we actually work very well with a lot of the emergency responders, specifically in your state. We did a, a large full-scale exercise. They had a joint terrorism task group, DHS, TSA, FBI, bomb and arson. It was a live drill uh, that we actually invited a, a congressional member uh, to that event uh, to witness the, the interagency uh, working together. So we do a lot of those things, but to your question on the air quality, that'd be more from a EPA standpoint. Uh, we're, we, we would deal with DHS and those other agencies from a security standpoint and let the other agencies handle uh, those uh, points that you pointed out earlier on the thing. But we do a lot of outreach. Um, we bring them on our site. We let them play on our site because uh, we have the live, uh, you know, the, the processes that they can't simulate somewhere else. So we do a lot of that outreach. Thank you. Mr. Welter. Yes, uh, just to add to that a, a bit, and thank you for the question, one thing I'll point out is when you look at the cadre of folks that we have inside of our company that we rely on for emergency response, whether they're in the emergency services and security function um, or they're operators that come to the, uh, to the incident uh, to help respond, many of those folks are themselves volunteer fire service um, individuals in the community, um, reserve deputies in law enforcement, um, emergency medical technicians or paramedics, and that's one of the powers that we harness by being able to look at our employee base as members of the community as well. Um, so there's a, there's a very strong focus on the emergency responder and what they bring whenever they increase the risk to themselves to help respond to an incident. So we wrap around that any and all measures that need to be taken to protect them, to equip them, to train them, recognizing the fact that they're taking additional risk beyond what the average employee does. So that's one component I think is important to keep in mind. Thank you. Ms. Roberts, how critical is it to get out to the community and to our first responders the health issues? It is exceptionally risk? important. Um, and not only first responders, but as you said, that of healthcare workers and others to be together in the community to have a complete understanding of the landscape of communities. One that I can uh, think about right now is the Manchester community of Houston, Texas, where you can't get in, and as well as the Mossville community in Louisiana, you cannot get in and out of those communities without going over a railroad track. So if indeed there is an incident, you can actually die on the other side waiting for a railroad track, to, for a rail car to be removed. So these are the types of things. In addition to that, the volunteer firefighters, as much as we love them, are not fully and adequately trained to really respond to these situations. And a case in point where, unfortunately, uh, the Congresswoman from Delaware had to leave, where the Crota plant 
uh, actually shut down. It was an ethylene oxide facility and the community folks had no idea what was going on. And this was the weekend of Thanksgiving, one of the highest travel times during going back and forth the Del across the Delaware Memorial Bridge. Each side of the bridge had to be shut down for six and one half hours. And so the communities had no idea what was going on. And, in, and indeed, as well as some of the local, emer uh, local volunteer firefighters. So these are the things that must be shored up these gaps. Thank we you, must Robert. have that, that kind of communication. Because my time is limited, Mr. Smith, uh, how important is it for our United Steel workers to be informed right away about health issues, particularly with Homeland being one of the first on the scene? I can tell you after spending years working in a chemical facility on the emergency response team and as a first responder in a municipal police department, that information sharing, information sharing is both critical and efficient. Uh, there is a big gap between those who are formulating the emergency response plan and those who are executing the emergency response plan. And I would like to see the department work to bridge that gap uh, with the critical information sharing. Just to end, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your flexibility. I recognize that Homeland Security would work along with EPA, and this would be one of their fundamental is issues, but they're there to coordinate the overall response to a terrorism event. And so they would be the first ones on the ground well before the EPA would ever get there. When we're talking about day two or three after an event, if there is carcinogens in the air or in the water, uh, it's absolutely still the Department of Homeland Security's responsibility as the coordinator of all these other agencies uh, to make sure that our workers in our local communities and our first responders and other local governments are made aware of these things and correct those. And thank you, Chairman. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the representative from California, Representative Ruiz, for five minutes, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm going to continue my line of questionings from the previous panel. Uh, and for this panel, I'd like to talk to or ask Mr. Fridley a question. We know that uh, threats to the security of chemical plants come in different forms, physical in nature, terrorist threats, theft, leaks, whatnot. Uh, and, and I want to bring up the threat of cybersecurity hacks. So we heard earlier uh, that the potential worst case scenario, uh, as described by Mr. Wolf, is a cybersecurity attack that uh, due to the production line could actually create a scenario where chemicals could be released uh, just through by somebody in a computer halfway across the globe. Uh, so I want to talk to you about what your assessment of the cybersecurity threats could be uh, in plants and your plant, for example, and can you give me uh, an example of what you do to address cybersecurity issues? I hope I turn it on. Thank you for the question. Um, to your point and exactly what was described as something that we actually took as a threat and we eliminated. Um, we have no uh, industrial control systems. When you took as a threat, was that because you were uh, it was mandatory for you to assess that, or you did it on your own? It was a joint effort between DHS and our company to be able to look at these specific threats. It was a joint effort, but is it through policy that you were forced to do it, or did you guys just kind of say, hey, this, this is a good idea? Through the uh, assessment, uh, when we're doing our site security okay. plans, we, so identified that as, yeah, yeah. We, we identified that as a risk. Um, so a couple of those things, we eliminated that. Uh, we also eliminated um, anything. When you say eliminated, what did you do? We have broken that gap between we have nothing on a computer system that controls any process any longer. Okay. So th that was one of the, the big gaps that we, we identified. We eliminated it. So that way now our biggest threat right now is probably a uh, suspicious order coming in. So we spend a lot yeah. of our time training our and, uh And who do you employ to help you with your, your cybersecurity systems? Do you contract out? No, or sir. Is it in-house? It's all in-house and they work. Is it difficult to find cybersecurity experts in your area? We're lucky enough to have some good very, very good people. And they work with the U.S. CERT on anything malware yeah. alerts and different things that come okay. up. Thank you. Uh, now I want to talk with Ms. Roberts. Uh, Ms. Cole said that um, the uh, agency consults with neighboring uh, communities regarding safety and other 
areas of consideration of that. And we know that, uh, that the vast majority of these plants are near minority, underserved, and poor communities, uh, and that leaks can be catastrophic depending on, on the amount of leak and what chemicals. Uh, so, and I know that you're with the National Coordinator of the Environmental Justice Health Alliance. Do you think the Department of Homeland Security should consult with the environmental justice communities or stakeholders uh, before planning, during planning, after an event uh, to protect chemical facilities against terrorist attacks, and do they do it? We believe that they should um, before, during, and after, yes. Yeah. Um, and do they do it? Do they do it? It depends. Um, unfortunately, we've just not seen them in our communities, on um, the communities we serve. Unfortunately, we see them after the fact. So he was saying how in every community they address the first responders or, uh, or specific people with titles. And I think that's, that's important, obviously, but uh, oftentimes those individuals are headquarters not in those communities, especially in rural counties. Uh, and so they're headquarters out in the big cities and not there. And the actual local residents who will be primarily affected by it don't get consulted. Is that what I'm hearing from, from you? Like those environmental organizations within the communities? Yes, it's, it's oftentimes after the fact. Um, what we, one thing that did happen under the previous administration, um, communities were indeed engaged. We were starting to try to engage in a process. Um, unfortunately, under this administration, it's not been the case. I have about a few seconds left. I just want to uh, mention that I introduced Bill H.R. 3923, the Environmental Justice Act of 2019, which requires agencies consider the environmental justice implications of their programs, policies, and activities, such as the Chemical Facility Anti-Terrorism Standards Program, helping ensure that we protect our communities and vulnerable populations and that there's meaningful consultations uh, before decisions are made and even mitigation uh, measures and, uh, and cleanup measures as well. Because no community should, ha should, there should be no decision about an issue that will affect the health and well-being of a community without the community's input. That's correct. And um, thankfully, our communities were engaged in the drafting of that bill and saw to it to try to make sure that they were protected by putting that language into that bill. So Thank there you. was consultation Absolutely. at that point. We then. made sure of that. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the uh, very patient representative from Colorado, Representative Deget, for five minutes, please. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank the panel for coming. I watched your testimony in my office, so I've been um, looking at everything everybody said. And as I said to uh, Mr. Wolf before, the Denver, which is my hometown, is not usually considered a hot spot of chemical industry activity, but we have over two dozen um, facilities that manufacture, process, or use enough hazardous chemicals that they're required to develop risk management plans under the Clean Air Act. A lot of those facilities are concentrated near the neighborhoods of Elyria, Swansea, and Globeville in North Denver, right next to a big industrial area of Commerce City. These are lower income communities with predominantly Hispanic households. And, um, and the same communities that bear a disproportionate share of the risk of terrorist attacks on chemical facilities also bear a disproportionate share of the pollution that they produce. I think Ms. Roberts can totally agree with that. And so, so um, like, like Mr. Ruiz and others, I really think that as well as a safety issue, we're, we're addressing an environmental justice issue here today. So I wanted to ask you, Ms. Roberts, given the vulnerability of what you call these fence line communities, how important would you say it is for the neighbors to know about what's going on at these, at these close by chemical plants? It is, excuse me, it is exceptionally important um, because with the slightest incident, um, if there was a release or what have you, that magic fence that the communities are told, you know, that will protect them, the magic fence, right. um, it will not hold uh, that incident. So once, it, once there is a release, it begins to move. Right. And depending upon the wind velocity and what have you, that's how fast or how slow it can move. Right. 
And, and you know, in these communities I just mentioned, uh, you're right, they're right along the border with this industrial area, and they're residential communities. So, you know, they don't, the, the chemicals don't just stop at the city and county of, of Denver. Um, is there is there something that community engagement can do to encourage a neighboring plant to reduce its vulnerability to attack? And what role does public scrutiny play in that? There's a lot that community engagement can do um, because communities do hold solutions. Um, and there are practical solutions that can be incorporated uh, to make sure that the safety of the community as well as the worker and in, in addition, the bottom line that many of these industries are really concerned about will all be factored in. Yeah. Um, so it is, it is extremely, extremely important for the health and well-being of that neighboring community. So, you know, this was one of the things I was talking about with Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary Wolf is uh, one of the things that um, chemical plants can try to do is to reduce the amounts of explosive or toxic chemicals on site where it's feasible. Would you agree with that, Ms. Roberts? Absolutely. And Mr. Fridley, what's your view on, on that? If, if it's feasible, wouldn't, wouldn't the best, best result to, to be to reduce those on-site chemicals? Yeah, from a security standpoint, we're always looking to reduce our, our threat and whatnot. But from the EPA standpoint of what you were going with in your first line, we do a lot of uh, different um, reports. We do the uh, EPA 304, 311, 312, 313, TRI, RMP that you did, CERCLA. Um, so we, we do a lot of the reporting right. out. So we're communicating out uh, to those folks or to anybody for that matter what the hazards and what the risks are. Well, what they need to know is what's there and what they can do. Now, Mr. Wheelchair, I wanted to ask you the same thing, is, is would you agree that if, if feasible, one of the best ways to reduce the risk is to remove unnecessary ca chemicals and hazardous substances? Thank you for the, uh, the question, and yes, um, and we've actually seen this in practice. So I, I relate earlier, um, during a CFAS inspection, it was uh, communicated from the inspector that there was a potential for us to reduce um, either the concentration or the quantity um, of the chemicals that we had on site. Um, and the business uh, took a look at that and immediately had a high interest in reformulating um, our processes to be able to do so, and then replicated that same process in non-regulated facilities. So, so we absolutely value the ability to reduce our right. risk. Mr. Smith, what's your view of that? I, I would agree with the rest of the panel. If you can uh, reduce a risk for the facility and the worker, I think it makes things safer and more secure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for, again for having this hearing. I yield back. You're welcome, and the general lady yields back. That, I believe, concludes all who were looking to ask questions of our second panel. I thank all of our witnesses again for joining us at today's hearing. I remind members that pursuant to committee rules, they have 10 business days by which to submit additional questions for the record to be answered by our witnesses. And then I ask that um, each witness respond promptly to any such questions that you may receive. Um, Mr. Mr. Also, Chairman, yes, before sir. you do that, uh, may I ask for a, a moment for uh, personal privilege? Yes, sir. Um, I want to recognize uh, my pastor who just came into the back of the room. Uh, he's here to give the uh, invocation or the prayer for tomorrow's uh, session. Uh, other than my wife, if you want to know who keeps me on the straight and narrow, it's uh, Pastor Wright. So uh, thank you for letting me uh, introduce him. Uh, thank you. And thank you, Pastor, for joining us. And thank you for leading the uh, ranking member in the right way. <laughs> Amen. We much appreciate it. Um, so I do request unanimous consent to enter a list of documents into the record. They include a letter from a coalition of organizations providing recommendations for the CFAS uh, reauthorization, a letter from the National Association of SARA Title III program officials, a letter from the National Association of Manufacturers, and a letter from the Fertilizer Institute and the Agricultural Retailers Association without objection, so ordered, so they are entered. Um, with that, the subcommittee is adjourned.